Hello, everyone, and thanks everyone for coming to the TerraSAM Space Days Colloquium 2022. Um, my name is Giulio Prisco. I'm going to be your host today, and uh, I'm uh, going to give a, a short introduction, and then I'm going to give the floor to the speakers. Before anything else, I want to remind you that uh, 53 years ago, on July 20, 1969, we went to the moon for the first time. That was great. But uh, three years after that, uh, in 1972, on December 14, we came back from the moon for the last time, that uh, it's not so great. We should do better than that. Uh, and that's why we are dedicating both uh, TerraSAM Colloquia these years to space, space flight, human space flight, and space expansion. We want to go back to the moon and beyond. In fact, the second uh, TerraSAM Colloquium this year is going to take place on December 14, which will be the 50th anniversary of the last day that a human walked on the moon. That will be in December. Uh, this colloquium today is more focused on uh, cultural and uh, physical and uh, spiritual aspects of space flight and human space expansion. The next one uh, is going to be more uh, focused on uh, practical things. Uh, I just want to show you this picture of me watching uh, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope a few months ago to give you the idea that for me, you know, this. Uh, an important space launch like that was like going to church. It was really like attending mass. I know that few people may find this, uh, this respectful, but uh, that is my personal case at least. It's really like going to church. And um, there is a concept of spirituality from space that you can uh, uh, draw spiritual inspiration from space flight. There is also a concept of spirituality for space, in the sense that uh, a new space-centered spirituality can uh, boost our spirit and our drive in our quest to expand outward into the solar system and beyond. And here, today. I hope uh, we will uh, speak of both these uh, aspects of space flight. So we're going to have uh, five uh, very top level speakers. Rick Tuminson, a legendary space activist. Ricardo Campa, a uh, philosopher and sociologist who has been uh, writing a lot about spiritual aspects of space flight recently. We will have uh, Elaine Walker, an electronic musician and uh, a space activist who is uh, also a philosopher in her spare time. We'll then have uh, Frank White of Overview Effect fame, and we will end with uh, Frank uh, Tipler of uh, Omega Point Cosmology fame to cover the cultural, philosophical, and spiritual aspects of space flight and space expansion. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't give the, the list right because uh, it uh, appears that due to a family emergency, Frank White is not going to be able to make it. That's 99% sure. Now, uh, I will say a few words when he stands a lot comes to give you my interpretation of his ideas. And um, uh, of course, if he does 
uh, can everyone uh, will be happy. I will, however, ask you to join me in 10 seconds of silence to send uh, the universe or uh, God, if you want, a request to show a lot of uh, kindness to Frank and his family. So the speakers will be in order, Rick Tomlinson, Ricardo Campa, Elaine Walker, uh, Frank White, probably by proxy, and Frank Tigler. And uh, perhaps I have said something wrong about the order. I just need to check if uh, Rick Tomlinson is back. Uh, he isn't. So what uh, I'd like to do, I'm sure that uh, Rick will understand. I'm going to give the floor to Ricardo Campa instead. Over to you, Ricardo. All right, thank you. So I'll try to share the screen first of all. So let's see if it works. Can you see it? Can yes, you can. All right. So uh, just to tell you, first of all, what is the, the spirit, let's say, of my presentation. I will not talk too much about starships or space exploration. Uh, I'd like to paraphrase a quote by Antoine de Saint-Esprit. that he said, if you want, but I just changed a couple of words here. If you want to build a starship, don't drum up with the demand to gather materials, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the uh, vast and endless space. Basically, you have to create this nostalgia of space, uh, giving a meaning, and then all the rest will come as a consequence. So uh, uh, excuse me if I interrupt one moment, Ricardo, I think uh, you should uh, click on the slide that uh, you are talking about, which I believe in this case is the second well, one. No, well, there is no slide here. This was just the ah, beginning. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. About the spirit that I, I will just talk about something that comes before, let's say. Uh, so that's the background of a presentation. So I mainly read the slides. I will comment over it, but I will not um, exaggerate with this comment. Otherwise, I will never keep inside the 25 minutes. Uh, so as the number of detected herd like exoplanets keep increasing, the prospect of a contact with extraterrestrial civilizations become day after day more plausible. So I started from this consideration. Which are the goals? This is a paper that we already published in uh, Theology and Science Co-authors are uh, astronomer Christopher Corbally from the Arizona State University and uh, anthropologist Margaret Bon Rappaport, and first author. So with this work, we aim to give a contribution to the codification of a theory of emerging no spheres. This will be clear later, the meaning of this, um, of this uh, expression the reconstruction of the history of this idea and possibly to open a space for discussions about, around it. So I will tackle the issue from the perspective of the history of ideas and the sociology of knowledge to emphasize the collective dimension of this, let's say, discovery. If you're not familiar with the history of ideas, I have to tell you that for an historian of ideas it is rather irrelevant if an idea is true or false it's rather in, in important that is, it is interesting. So someone may even write the history of the pink unicorn if you find records in the literature. And um, so I'm not an astronomer, I'm not a physicist, I'm an historian of idea and a sociologist. 
secondly, this is the corollary of this uh, approach. So the no sphere is an abstraction and it has been understood in different ways by different scholars rather than the invention of an isolated genius. Even if I will focus mostly on Pierre Théard de Chardin, but it's just one of the many that was like um, uh, theorizing the, no, the, the idea of no sphere and the merging no spheres. So let's start from the 19th century. So in the 19th century, 1883 actually, uh, Aust uh, between 1883 uh, and 99, Austrian geologist Edward Seward published a four volume work uh, entitled The Face of the Earth. And this was destined to be one of the most widely used um, manuals, handbooks in geology. So these are very simple concepts, but at that time they are kind of new. So it's a, we, we have a, a lithosphere and then over it, there is a biosphere and then an atmosphere. So there are different spheres overlapping each other. And but after reading this book, several scholars came to this idea that there must be one more, let's say envelope. So quite interestingly, uh, Edward Seuss feels it necessary to specify that he's leaving aside all speculative hypotheses as to the possible presence of living beings on other heavenly bodies. This hypothesis was already discussed in the 19th century. The next step was, let's say, in the air. So the planet started being seen as developing through three different phases and ontological statuses. So the first was the geosphere lithosphere and the hydrosphere, or the inanimate planet. The second was the biosphere or the living planet. And the third one, and that's the new idea that comes kind of automatically to most people, the noosphere or the thinking planet. So notoriously, this term derived from the Greek <clears throat> word nose, which, is, which means mind and sphere, that means sphere. So in the 1920s, at least, at least three important scholars, namely Pierre Théard de Chardin and Vladimir Vernarsky and Edouard Leroy, used the term no sphere almost simultaneously. So it's difficult to say who started this because these people were meeting in conferences and so we don't know who really invented the word, but this is at the moment not our main preoccupation. Uh, it was a multiple discovery. Here comes the sociology of science or sociology of knowledge, because time was ripe in the 20th century for the emergence of this idea and the plurality of minds contributed to it. So uh, as a sociologist Robert Merton noticed, when scientific discoveries are in the air, they will be made independently more than once and singletals will be conceived as first out multiples. Basically he said all discoveries are multiples. At the point, if someone doesn't do it, someone else will do it in another place. And I give you a few examples <clears throat> because, of course, scholars may use a different name even later. So we got the 20s, we got these three scholars, but even later, there were other autonomously, let's say, rediscovering the same thing. So this idea is uh, well known the meme pool. So in 1975, biologist Richard Dawkins introduced a very successful term, meme. Today, of course, it is used in social networks with a different meaning, but, or similar, it's a similar meaning, but uh, in red, reductive terms, let's say. But in its original formulation, it was closely linked to that of the no sphere. To express the later concept, the expression used was meme pool by Richard Dawkins. So Dawkins spoke of a primordial soap of self-replicating entities which resemble what genes are in relation to organisms. These entities are parasitic toads that reproduce and spread by using human brains as hosts. Uh, if we look at the propagation process of the meme pool from social biological point of view, the speaker's intention of it is of secondary importance, if not completely irrelevant. It gives a few examples. For, for instance, it gives the example of the idea of God. That spreads around thanks to uh, art or uh, literature or other means. Notoriously, Richard Dawkins is an atheist. Yes? So it doesn't matter why this word was used. You can use religion as instrumentum reigning, just to establish your power 
over people, or you can use, let's say, more in a more spiritual way because you are a mystic, for instance. But this is irrelevant. The word and the concept keep, keeps going around. Using brains in a parasitic way. Parasitic way. Example number two is word three. This is another abstraction that approaches the idea of no sphere, the no sphere. Uh, this term, word three, was introduced by, developed or introduced by Karl Popper and John Eccles in 1977. By word three, the authors means the complex of products of the human mind, uh, such as, for instance, explanatory myths, stories, scientific theories, tools, social institutions, and scientific problems, and works of art. Immediately, when people were reading that book, they were thinking about the hyperuranium by Plato, uh, the world of ideas, say the mind of God. Still, they distinguish it explicitly from that, um, uh, that idea because they, of course, first of all, they distinguish three words. I don't know if you read the book, but it's quite famous book. Word one is the physical word. Word two is the psychological word. And word three, they clarify, includes both true and false theories. And therefore, it is not an equivalent of Plato's hyperuranium, when you could find only true, beautiful, and just ideas. Contrary to what Dawkins assumes, Popper and Eccles maintain that ideas do not exist only encoded in material objects, such as computers, books, or brains. They are unembodied objects. I remember that I knew him personally, Mario Bunga from uh, Montreal University. He started following Popper's after this idea because he was a materialist, so he couldn't accept this idea. By the way, I'll give you one more example, another idea that approaches the idea of no sphere, and is the idea of infosphere. The term was used for the first time back in 1971 by Shepard, probably echoing Marshall McLuhan in much the way the fish cannot conceptualize water or, or birds in the air, man merely understand his infosphere. The infosphere is understood as that encircling layer of electronic and typographical smoke composed of fishes from journalism, entertainment, advertising, and government. This is another famous guy, futurist, that used that concept of the infosphere. In 1981, futurist Alvin Toffler distinguishes three different waves of civilization and clarifies that different layers make the thinking envelope of the planet. Moreover, the infosphere, the infosphere interacts with other layers, such as the technosphere, the social sphere, and the biosphere. And now, finally, we come to this idea as it was developed by Théard de Chardin. It started back in the 1920s, but he came back to this idea several times. And of course, he has the most, let's say, spiritual or religious approach. So, contrary to his rivals, the Nosphere, as conceived by Théard, leads the way to an astrotheological conception of the cosmos by looking beyond planet Earth and keeping the divine plane into the picture. Uh, if you're interested in this concept, astrotheology, I may recommend a book that was edited by Ted Peters and others. And um, it's quite interesting. So uh, Dawkins, let me just see if I can, sorry, something went wrong. Okay. Uh, Dawkins, Poppers and Eccles, Toffler, also discuss the idea of extraterrestrial life, but they do not explore this hypothesis from an astrotheological perspective. Um, Teilhard notes that the nosphere tightens its net around us tangibly and materially. Furthermore, its psychic potential continues to increase. It grows both in terms of occupied space and intensity. This means that we are facing a super organization of matter. It is visible, uh, it is a visible form, it's, its visible form is the collectivization of human activities, while its effects is a further liberation of consciousness. 
So Teilhard takes up the subject again in the 1947 in an essay entitled The Formation of the Noosphere. Quite interestingly, the idea of noosphere is presented as a sociological concept. That's why it attracted my interest as a sociologist. Not just one concept of among many, but as the cornerstone of a general theory of human society. For the social philosophers of the past, the legal aspects of society were of fundamental importance. To the contrary, sociologists then began seeing society as a living organism with its own emergent properties. And in his essay, Teilhard mentioned, for instance, Auguste Comte, the founder of sociology, and then Antoine Cournot and Emile Durkheim, one of probably the most famous sociologists together with Max Weber, and Lucien levy Brule. So that's interesting. He's a paleoanthropologist. He's a theologian, but he's quoting many sociologists to give his own theory. And that's a famous quote by the other show then. We are one. After all, you and I together, we suffer together, together and forever we recreate each other. So he points out that humanity appears less and less like a casual and extrinsic association of individuals and increasingly like a biological entity. The idea of individual was central in the enlightenment while in, in the 19th century and later there was this idea of, of society as an organism that was like more than an association of individuals. So TRs know the existence of a paradox in this sociobiological conception. Seen from the point of view of biology, humanity is a deeply enigmatic object because anatomically, the human being differs very little from other higher primates. However, humanity has become the mistress of the earth. So how this is possible? TR believes that the paradox will disappear if we enlarge our approach to encompass the formation of a particular biological entity such um, as has never before existed on earth. The, and here is a quote, the growth outside and above the biosphere of an added planetary layer, an envelope of thinking substance to which for the sake of convenience and symmetry, I've given the name of the no sphere. So he claimed that he invented his name. So that's the thing, that's the human paradox. As individuals, we are nothing special. As a collective entity, we approach divinity because through socialization, each individual can acquire many notions and informations that would never other animals cannot do, thanks to the noosphere. So concerning anatomy, Teilhard distinguishes between th three different apparatuses of the thinking envelope. One is the hereditary apparatus. The second is the mechanical apparatus. And the third is a cerebral apparatus. The interesting thing is that contrary to Popper and Eccles, the French scholar does not classify computers in the mechanical apparatus, but in the cerebral one. Computers are not mere instruments. They are thinking machines. Um, so between human intelligence and artificial intelligence, according to Théa de Chardin, there is much more than an auxiliary relationship. A synergy, if not a merger, is underway. This stupendous thinking machine, this is his own expression, um, basically uh, concentrate and um, um, basically you have this, 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 this entity that has emergent psychic properties. As you know, if you join together different things, you create a new one that has emergence property. A group of people, they have properties that a single individual don't have, as well as our organism has properties. For instance, we can think that the single organs that don't have like heart and arms and so on. So we need all together to have these emergent properties. So this is the prospect, by the way, what you see is in the future. The prospect is a super organization of matter, a super revolution of humanity, a new sense of collectivity, the pervasion of humanity by the power of sympathy, a higher order of awakening, 
a new form of intimacy that will chart the entire complex of interhuman and intercosmic relations. And here we got the big question. What will be the fate of the no sphere when it will have to become charged to the fullest extent with psychic energies? They are excluded as nonsensical. The hypothesis is that after millions of years of evolution, after reaching the highest possible level of such consciousness and reflection, life on Earth could face extinction. In his words, the possibility of the total extinction of humanity revolts and sickens us, as well as we are talking about extinction now in relation to global warming. They were talking about extinction at that time in relation to the Cold War, because we are after the Second World War and we are humans started developing atomic weapons. Uh, so notoriously, at this point, Teart crosses the border of social biology to enter the field of theology. He speculates that an ultra center of unification and consistency plays the role of a catalyst, attracting the curve of consciousness. The later is expected to keep pushing is um, is continuous of growing complexity to the point of breaking through the material framework of time and space. This ultra center of unification is the cosmic Christ who call us from the future, who inspire our evolutionary path from the alpha of creation and the omega of the apocalypse. Of course, all this discussion makes sense for Christians or post-Christians, because if one is a Buddhist or an atheist, of course, all this discussion about the cosmic Christ doesn't really make sense unless he is a syncretist, yes. Uh, you can understand that this was, it wasn't seen well by the, like a Catholic hierarchies, because it was trying to change the meaning of Jesus Christ itself, not as an historical figure, but as something else, more spiritual. Um, this remind me this sentence, sorry for my bad Germans, but nur noch ein Gott kann uns retten. So this is a sentence by Martin Heidegger. Uh, basically, he's telling us that only a God can save us, which is more or less what Théard de Chardin said. Oh, only a God can save us from extinction, but we need to think God in a different way. That is his point. So having reached his maturity, humanity should remain alone face to face with itself to transfigurate into a non-material, purely psychic entity. So the terrestrial no sphere would immediately transcend the space-time frame to reach a higher dimension. But here he has an hesitation. Uh, he said, okay, at this point, the no sphere reach his is like a apogeum, his maximum level. And then something happened that we enter in a different dimension. But then he said, well, unless we are destined by contact with other thinking planets across the abysses of space and time, someday to become integrated with an organized complex composed of a number of no spheres. But again, then as, as Second hesitation is said, mm, no, this, this, not, this alternative destiny is infinitely improbable. So to sum up, then we can say that he has formulated three different hypotheses about the destiny of, you, destiny of humanity. The first is extinction, but he said it's impossible. But this is a man of faith speaking, yes? Of course, if one is a non-believer, this is perfectly possible. Uh, second point. Mm, immediate transcendence, so our planet transcend, and he considered it in 1947 as the most plausible hypothesis. Sorry for this noise, it's my clock. Okay. And the third hypothesis is uh, the hypothesis of the merging no spheres, but he says at this point is infinitely improbable. But here there's another big question. The most plausible scenario open up another fundamental question. Um, what happens to the evolutionary process at the cosmic level when a thinking planet Earth reaches its critical point of planetary reflection and access to some sort of transhuman in the ultimate heart of things? This is a quote from, from um, Théard de Chardin. 
does the whole process stop or continue in undisturbed? So that's a very good question. I mean, we, there's not just this, this planet as in the Ptolemaic uh, yes, picture of the cosmos. There are, there are billions of planets and galaxies. And so what happened to the rest of the cosmos? So he said, probably that solution that I provided, immediate transcendence is not the good one because I have to think about the rest of the space. In this, in the first case, too much importance seems to be attributed to a single tiny planet in the vast universe, Earth. In the second case, we must admit that many processes that, that develop according to the alpha evolution omega scheme go on across the universe. Of course, you need a solution. This is a problem, of course, that only Christians have. Again, if you're a Buddhist or an atheist, you wouldn't discuss this problem. You just take it as a possibility, but he had to reflect a lot because Christianity is a monotheistic religion. The unicity of God requires a solution that contemplates a single narrative with three main protagonists, God, the universe and its evolution, a big history capable of giving sense to the totality of the cosmos and not just to a tiny dot in it that was needed. So six years later in 19, 53, he wrote another article in French entitled Une suite au problème des origines humaines, la multiplicité des mondes habités. So the multiplicity of inhabited worlds, and you find it in, in English in Christianity and Evolution, in this book, collection of essays. So Teilhard writes that the new picture of a cosmos produced by 20th century astronomy naturally lead to the conclusion that there must be other inhabited worlds, other forms of intelligent life, myriads of no sphere that are emerging all around the universe. If there are millions of galaxies in the universe, there must be thousands of millions of solar systems and planets where life has equal chance, chances to emerge. As you can see, I didn't use the pictures of a web telescope, but this gives the idea anyway. In each celestial body, matter has the same general composition. If in each celestial body, matter has the same general composition and undergoes essentially the same evolution as inside the Milky Way, the evolutionary process will likely, likely lead to an anthropogenesis, that is to the emergence of thinking beings similar to Homo sapiens. And now we will understand what it means similar um, for the other side. And then he goes on, and he said that on potentially inhabitable planets, inhabitable planets, human-like beings will certainly evolve to the point of being able to build machinery and communication technologies. A thinking envelope, envelope a no-sphere, would cover the biosphere of inhabited exoplanets exactly as it is covering the Earth now. They are clarified that the term human and its derivatives like humanities or humanitarian and so on must be understood as synonymous with a psychically reflected life. So that's interesting, yes, because taking this definition, any alien, any if he's intelligent, if he's reflecting about his or her own existence or their own existence, then of course they are human. Think about all the discussion in the transhumanist movement about the difference between humans, transhumans, posthumans. These are just uh, like eliminated all these problems when you define humans this way. Transhumans are humans and posthumans are humans as well. <clears throat> what about the traditions, the traditional interpretation of the Bible? Again, a problem that was important to him as he was a Catholic priest. Three. There are three possible solutions to save Christianity, Christian dogmas. One, according to him, is... Um, Excuse me, uh, Ricardo, you have three minutes left. Yes, I'm uh, very close to finish. The second is absurd. The third is ridiculous. Uh, sorry, uh, the third is humiliating. Uh, I can do something. I can skip this part, because this can be interesting, as I said, for Christians, but not for... So where is discussing these things? This, this his idea of neo Christianity. Okay, basically, 
here we come to the point. Yes, this is, I said, we just need one dogma. We can get rid of all the other dogmas. Like the other dogmas are the original sin and redemption as it is understood, understood in the Christian tradition. We said, we just need one dogma in omnia constant. So in him, all things all together. So then we, we check by starting with this dogma and current scientific knowledge, we, are, we can find a new narrative, let's say, that put together religion and science. So there is every reason to believe, this is a quote, that should material contact be affected between two hominized planets, they will be able, at least through their no spheres, to understand one another, combine, and be synthesized in uh, one another. So the most plausible prospect then is a universal synthesis capable, capable of waking up and bringing the light of consciousness to the whole universe. So this is what we mean by a theory of the emerging North spheres. Basically, what would be the practical consequences? If this is the sense, the direction, the goal, we just have to get going and launch once more our challenge to the stars. This was the slogan of the Italian futurist at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, okay, I don't know if my time is gonna just one last thought at the end, yes, that the idea that our existence only makes sense against the background of this theory is difficult to accept by pragmatic minds focused on the problems of everyday life. That we are basically saying that the that this entire process of cosmic evolution can become fully meaningful thousands, if not millions of years from now. This, this seems hardly consoling to those to who yearn for an immediate response to their existential problem. Still, for philosophical minds, the speculative anticipation of this scenario can already constitute a moment of spiritual ascent of mystical communion with the all and produce the feeling that one is always and in any case, in the right place at the right time, whatever you're doing, because you're contributing to the universe um, to wake up. This could be the conclusion here. I put a picture of uh, Thierry de Chardin because he was the main protagonist of this story. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ricardo. It was a great talk. And uh, I don't. Uh, think we have uh, any time for questions and answers. Uh, i just like to share my impression that uh, I do myself like very much this, uh, I would say, modern interpretation of the thoughts of Thaler. And uh, the finishing message of Ricardo that, uh, you know, it is up to us to bring uh, consciousness out there to the universe. I think uh, it's also a very modern message that is uh, shared by all people here. With the exception, I think, of uh, Frank Tipler, but Frank is not here yet, so I think we all agree on this. So thank you very much again, Ricardo. And I'd like uh, now to give the floor to Rick. Floor is yours, Rick. But uh, yes. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> well, first of all, my apologies. Um, it is around this time of the year every year that I reset all my passwords. Uh, excuse me. Um, Can you hear me. We cannot really hear you too loud. Perhaps you should uh, get closer to the microphone. Yes, I will. Um, as I was saying, um, and I'm going to pump up the volume. Um, this is the time of year when I actually reset a lot of passwords and such on my, my computer. And um, conveniently, right before we started today, it completely crashed. So I have grabbed my uh, trusty laptop and am uh, speaking to you from there. If you'll give me just a moment, I can uh, increase this. One, two, one, two, that should be better. Yes, is it bit better? Can you increase it a bit more? Absolutely. There we go. One, two, one, two. 
Uh, I hear you well. Does everyone re uh, hear Rick well? Okay, good. That's great. Uh, great. Most most of the time, people don't want to hear me louder. They just want me to go away. Um, so, look, I I did take my word. Uh, I had a really nice PowerPoint. Um, but uh, so I'm going to freestyle a little bit here with you, and. Uh, uh, it was great hearing the last presentation, and by the way, I'm very honored uh, that you've invited me to this colloquium. Uh, first of all, I do want to do a little bit of a plug. There is an event we're holding here in Austin in the fall called the New Worlds, uh, New Worlds 2022 um, and the Space Cowboy Ball. And uh, y'all are invited. It'll, uh, it'll all be going live within the next week. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, echo out uh, through your list or whatever. Um, and uh, Gabriel and, and Martin and others have, have been involved with this in the early years. This year we're going uptown. We've taken the three year break um, and, uh, you know, from the before times and uh, we've uh, scaled it up and hired professionals and it's going to be a, an amazing show. It's a renaissance event. Um, and then the ball is a costume party. We give out awards. The ball asks the question, what would you wear to a party on Mars in 100 years? Um, and uh, we get some really interesting uh, answers to that. Uh, but uh, you all are definitely invited, and uh, we look forward to having a lot of conversations um, at this event. Uh, moving on, um, to address the, the sort of cosmic topics we're dealing with today, of course, for me, it all comes down to that question of, you know, why are you here? Or why are we here? Or why am I here? And I don't mean here on this wonderful show, but I mean, on this rock hurtling through the universe. Why do we exist? What's the point of it all? Who are we? Where do we come from? You know, it, it's really interesting because it must have been slowly but definitely confusing for this ape-like creature that uh, had lived its life in complete survival mode on the savannas of Africa to slowly begin to spark, to, to, to have the spark occur in the neuronal matrix of their brains to where they began to look down and say, well, what is this? And look up and go, what is that? And why is this happening? And who am I? These, these kinds of questions, as they began to creep into the minds of it, at least some uh, of these early creatures, uh, Zinjanthropus, Australopithecines, maybe a little bit later. And these kind of ideas started to flow in. And um, you know, what, what do you do with that? What, what do you do with that? And, and especially when you're seeing forces moving in the universe around you, moving in the world around you that you can't explain. Remember, um, at that period of time, uh, you know, as they began to discover fire and such, that everything beyond the firelight at night was deadly. Everything beyond that firelight was deadly. And at the same time, you'd be laying back, looking up at the heavens, and you'd see this amazing canopy, this display of the galaxy flowing overhead in regularity, but, but with things happening and comets shooting across and things like that. And um, you, you would begin to then try and rationalize that in your mind as to, to, well, who are they? What is that? Or is that a they? You know, and this is, this is part of it. And, you know, we as a species, I believe, are incredibly lonely. And so what did we do at that point in our in our evolution is we begin to populate this universe, the, the world, the universe beyond the firelight, beyond the circle of the fire. We begin to populate it with things. Some of them are basically designed to keep us alive. So, for example, don't go into the shadows, my child. There are demons out there. There are evil spirits. You will be kidnapped. That is that's where danger is. And so that weaves its way into the tales of the time. Or these things are happening up here. Obviously, this is above us. We can't reach it. We can't get there. This must be God. These, this is obviously, these are the powers. That's where they are. They're the ones who are making all this stuff happen. And, and off you go. And the different mythologies start to branch out into to all kinds of different ways. So that when there's a storm, the gods are angry. and. Um, you know, these, when we have a drought, the gods must be upset, so we have to sacrifice another baby. I mean, all of these things kind of come out of us populating this universe around us, projecting in a way, projecting into that universe who we are, 
uh, anthropomorphizing it, as, as, as you might say. And this begins to give us comfort. This makes us feel that we are not alone. And it gives us some explanations. So the early astronomers, of course, these were people who were actually studying these things, and they were doing it for two reasons. A, they were trying to understand what these gods were, and uh, you know you can get into the development of the way the pyramids were built and, and, and the way they echo Orion's belt and all of this. There was certainly a deeper awareness of the cosmos then than we have today, where we have light pollution and most people never look up. Um, and so these, these ideas were, were beginning to form. Of course, they were also looking at them for the periodicity of things. And, uh, you know, if this, the sunlight hits this spot on the rock once a year, um, that tells us that this is the time for the harvest or maybe the sacrifice to make sure we have a good harvest, depending on which path that mythos has taken in those particular cultures. But all of it has to do with being lonely. All of, us, all of it has to do with seeking that answer trying to understand who we are, why we are. And that grows and grows. And, you know, we begin to want to like, well, how can I become that? How do I join that? And now keep in mind, pre-technology, when everything is basically, uh, um, there's a mysticism about life. Um, we wanted to ascend. We wanted to get up there with those creatures. We want to be one with the universe out there with these friends, frenemies, let's call them, in the case of some of the gods that we've created. And, and so what we do is we create paths to ascendancy. But those paths to ascendancy are basically metaphysical. They are not physical. The way you ascend to the heavens at that point in time, the way you become one with this universe, the way you become uh, joining communion with these gods, with these beings we've created, is you have to go on a metaphysical journey. You have to basically die or you have to go out and sit in a hut and do some incredible drugs and shift yourself into another place. Um, I have, I was at a rock concert last night. I saw some people shifting themselves into another place right then just to be able to uh, understand the band train. Uh, but you know, these, that's how we did it and how many people still do it. Um, of course, priests arose because they had some appearance of control or at least appearance of communion with these gods in the heavens. In other words, they could predict, they knew when the floods were going to come, they knew when the droughts were going to come, when we have to sacrifice the babies or the symbolic sacrifices that began to replace that in some cultures. So they begin to ascend and, and uh, uh, be able to reach and commune with these, these higher levels. Of course, they become eventually the astronomers. And then it starts to shift. So along the way, um, as we're, moving forward like this, um, we start to begin to commune with the universe in a slightly different way. And that is we start to begin to understand it a little bit. We begin to look at ourselves as, as starting to have some grasp of these things. That mythology is still there, of course. I mean, think about it. If, if, you, if you jump to the present, just think about it. You know, because those creatures, those friends and frenemies of ours in the universe always have to be better than we are. They have to be, or what's the point, right? I mean, you can't worship somebody who's like stupider than you are or has less power than you are or is weaker than you are. You have to worship something that is bigger and better than you. And, and so what we've done is we, we've taken, as our culture has grown, we take this loneliness, right? And this need for explanation and we put them together. And then we get all these great theories and ideas and rolling all this stuff together, but that, that's really what it is, you know? And, and along the way, of course, we can't, we have this terrible little problem called death, you know? And of course we don't understand that at all, which of course then opens up an entire another realm that we have to explain. And certain mythologies kick into gear to make that either um, something they can explain or something they can leverage as the Christian church does to control your behavior in the present world, the present time. Um, you know, that's, that's, by the way, why death is considered, you know, um, such an evil thing. That's why people who want to create health extension or life extension are considered basically evil. I mean, you know, we've epitomized that in our, in our development of monsters, right? Frankenstein, 
all of that that should be dead you know um the vampires they they live great they dress really well um they're very slick they're very cool but they're condemned because they live forever they have this dark side they have to suck the life blood out of humans i mean look at that that that's demonizing this idea why because particularly in the christian faith that we have that has dominated our cultures you have to have the leverage of heaven and hell or you can't control the people today and oh my god if people live forever then i don't i've lost my lever right and on and on you know zombies can't kill them now my personal theory is that zombies represent everything in the world you can do nothing about like the the tax you know your, your tax bureaucracy <laughs> you know these are things that just come at you they don't hate you they don't want to kill you they just want to eat your brains right so they're just coming and and the, you know you have to stab them in the head or whatever walking dead tells you to do but they they don't hate you they're just malicious entities that show us a lack of our own control of destiny so all of these things come together you know, if we can ascend into this heaven, we can uh, we can reach immortality. We can commune with, or perhaps become gods. We can control the destiny, our our, our life cycles, our, our farming cycles, our cultural cycles, and all of this. And slowly, then we begin to understand more and more that the ascendance to this particular heaven, this this place, is something that we can actually do physically. And that's the era that we have found ourselves in now with the opening of what I call the frontier. Um, I've spent 35 years fighting this fight to make this happen um, and uh, been a part of uh, different organizations. Uh, I will do a shout out to my mentor and a, and a, and a close friend of Martin's, who you'll see later, uh, Gerard K. O'Neill, who was the person who first showed up and said, you know, you don't have to be an astronaut to go into space, which by the way, there's kind of a holiness to that, right? Um, you don't have to be a, a government employee. You don't have to be a scientist, et cetera, to participate in this. You can just be a person. And you can use the principles of free enterprise and democracy and the resources of space to expand humanity out. Uh, Dr. O'Neill was my mentor, and I believe is sort of the godfather of the entire movement that you see right now. Um, and so I'm shifting into a slightly different gear here. And what we see now is this, this uh, undeification of space the destruction of the deification of accessing physically the universe you don't have to be an astronaut you don't have to be a government agency you don't have to be any of those things you can just be a human being and i, I show people in a different kind of talk that i do where i talk about the government and the private sector um, i like to show a picture of the what i call the senate launch scam here in america which is this giant rocket that's the government's building to waste a ton of money. Um, and then we have the SpaceX Starship, which uh, uh, Elon Musk is building. And what's really interesting about that is the only difference between those two is a set of beliefs. They are basically the same pieces of metal. They use the same physics principles. They use basically the same sorts of propellant. They're constructed in basically the same sort of way. The difference between the two, one of which is costing our nation 25, 30 billion dollars, will fly three or four times, if it flies at all, won't do anything except suck a ton of money out of the universe or out of our culture. And the other one, which will help it open the frontier to humanity, is this person over here has a belief that humanity should expand beyond the earth and is manifesting that by building this system to make it happen. These people over here in the old system, old space, let's call it. I, I came up with a word a few years ago to delineate between the two. I call it new space is, is where we are now. Uh, this old space system, they, they really don't have a belief in this. And I'm not talking about the people that work in it. I'm not talking about the wonderful people who do all of the incredible uh, advancements and, and things like that in it. I'm talking about the system itself is not based on a belief other than pump the money into the pockets of politicians, etc. So this one entity, this one group of people, let's call them new space, let's call them the frontier movement, the cause, they believe our job is to open the frontier to humanity and go out there. 
And so what that results in is an entirely different approach to everything. Our job isn't to keep the cost high and make sure we get more contracts. Our job is to keep the cost low and get as many people out there as we can. Our job isn't to go get things uh, to, to compete with any particular nation or anything like that. Our job is to expand the domain of life and humanity into the universe. So these are the things that differentiate us as we're beginning to move into this new future. So as I've been dealing with this, I used to rationalize this using spreadsheets and or the kinds of things you would put in spreadsheets. You know, we can go into space, you know, because people always say, well, what good is space? Why space? Why do we care? And I would give all the traditional answers and, you know, well, we can, uh, you know, we can solve a lot of medical problems and we can, it is a strategic high ground. We can create new products. We can beam clean energy from space. We can do all of these great things. I, I founded one of the asteroid mining companies a few years ago. We were a little bit early. Uh, the game isn't over yet, but um, all of these ideas, space resources, these kinds of things. But then that slowly began to change for me, and it started in, in, in 2011. Um, that was the year um, I'd been fighting for years on this stuff. And in fact, that was around the time we were having our big success. Uh, my, one of my organizations, the Space Frontier Foundation, we actually changed the laws and the conversation in Washington that allowed SpaceX to get funded and fly. We actually fought off some of these senators of the old school who were trying to kill it. So you hear stories about Elon Musk um, not being able to, you know, if he had blown his rocket on the second or third flight, SpaceX would have died. What people don't realize is at the same time, there were people sitting in their kitchens calling up staffers in Washington to protect his budget. If they had failed, there would be no SpaceX either. So I've been through this sort of hands-on revolution, uh, kind of, I, I hate to call it the front line, but sort of front line approach. Um, and around 2011, well, exactly in 2011, um, I had moved to Texas here, where I am now, I live in Austin. Um, and my idea had been to be close to my family, to be near my mother, my mom, little English mother, um, and also try and change the political environment for space in Texas, because I believe that, because it was a very powerful um, uh, group of people coming from Texas into Washington, that we could change then what happened in Washington and change what would happen in the world. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I got to spend three months down here with my mother, um, and then she died in an accident. It, it was a it was a terrible long six week ordeal. Um, and we lost her. And what I did was I, I did uh, something very unusual for somebody like me is uh, I moved in with my father in their new house in the country in East Texas, it's a beautiful house. It was their dream house. They were literally in the middle of moving when this happened. And it was a very tough, terrible time. But at one point um, during this period of time, I, I one night, I, uh, it was about three days after we put her in the ground, I walked out into the pasture in front of the house in the middle of the night. Uh, there was basically a crescent moon in the sky at the time. It was so dark that you could almost make out the Milky Way. I could hear the crickets, I could hear the cicadas in the trees, I could hear the horses shuffling in the pastures near me. It was beautiful, it was amazing. And for me, what was important was that I was cracked open at that moment. As any of you know, and all of us face tragedies, in those kind of moments, you're vulnerable, you're open. Some choose to move in one way or another uh, and, and leverage off of those moments. Who knows? That's an individual thing that happens to all of us. In that moment for me, I was able to suddenly feel something that I, I knew I had been operating from for 20 years at that point, but I couldn't put words to it. And what happened was I felt this unity i felt my other mother because i knew my my blood mother loved me but i felt my other mother the one i was standing on the ecosphere in which i was in basically expressing love to me and i felt that love and at the same time though i felt i looked up and i looked into the universe above me the the galaxies that i could see the stars that i could see and i kind of let myself fall up into that to go up into that place And I felt called. I felt a calling at that moment. I felt the universe saying, come, join us. 
join me. We're one. Whatever the translation is, it wasn't in words. All the words are overlays. We all know that on this in this type of meeting. These are overlays we put on things we can't explain. But I knew that I had a purpose. <clears throat> I had thought I had a purpose. I thought I was clear on it. But I was going through the motions. <clears throat> and I realized that my purpose, our purpose as human beings is, is something magnificent. And not only that, that if we can begin to act on this purpose right now, we might be able to save the planet. You see, I believe we are at the end of the most important hundred years in the history of humanity. Or no, let me raise the stakes on that. Um, um, or civilization or humanity or, or life itself, maybe even life in the universe. I'm one of those people who, you know, this is all an equation when you're looking at like, are there, are there other worlds out there? Are there, are there aliens out there? Oh, by the way, isn't it interesting that um, whenever ET shows up, they have to be massively superior to us. They reach down, ET reaches us with a little glowing finger and it, you know, we've replaced the demons on the outside of the circle of light. They're aliens now. It comes from the same place in our mind. It comes from the same loneliness. See, the higher technology in an age where you don't have technology is a spiritual technology. And therefore, they are higher based on their spiritual technology being higher. They are gods. To be higher than we are in a technological society, which doesn't, you know, that's just silly stuff. They have to be technologically superior. And so we've made them that way. And now they arrive over our cities and these weird looking things and the shadow and everybody looks up and all of that, right? So we've just replaced them. But maybe they're not out there. Maybe we are it. Just maybe. If one looks at the evolution of the universe, if, if one looks at all the close calls we've had, if one looks at the, the Goldilocks zone, the, the seconds between whether another major asteroid rather than the dinosaur killer have missed the planet, things like that. Or if one looks at the fact that other worlds may have the same congresses and parliaments that we do right now. And they fried because they couldn't take action on their own abuse of their own ecospheres. It's a very likely point, by the way, you know, we have a, we have the demonstration right now. We are in the middle of an experiment as to whether advanced civilizations can save themselves from themselves. And the experiment's failing. So that one existence proof we have right now is this. The other point too, for me, is just a very pragmatic one. I want them to be out there. Like Sagan said, billions and billions of stars, isn't it grand? You know, they're, they're out there, maybe. But I have this, I keep this on my desk. When I am playing cards, I can only bet on the card that's in front of me, the cards that are in front of me that I can see. And the cards that I can see right now are on this sphere, are on this planet, are in this ecosphere that we are in. That's the card I have to bet on. And that's the card I have to put all of my wager behind. I can't bet that the aliens are going to come save us or that the mystical gods are going to come save us or that if and when I, I move from this physical entity, I'm going to be reincarnated as in Buddhism or, or, I, or you know, in, in some other religion or I'm going to go to heaven or hell in, in, in the Christian religion. I can't bet on that. That's going to happen no matter what I do or how long I live. At the end of that termination, something's going to happen or nothing's going to happen. The card I can bet on now is my life today on a planet that I live in now, in a universe that I am experiencing now that doesn't seem to be showing any signs of advanced technological societies. Oh, maybe they've ascended to a higher plane, loaded their bodies into little robots, and they've gone into other dimensions. Fine. Totally irrelevant to my state of being right now. Totally irrelevant to the state of being on this planet. And I hope we run into them. And on their way into the solar system, I would like us to be as far out there as we can so I can sell them cheeseburgers as they're coming to visit. But I can't see them right now. Oh, by the way, the card's a joker. Look, I believe that we have a purpose. 
I created an organization called the Earthlight Foundation, which has been very quiet. We're getting ready to roll out a brand new website also in about a week. And the Earthlight's foundation's organization or, or, or purpose itself is to begin to inculcate our movement, those of us who are working in this field, with a set of core principles and beliefs. Now, I can't necessarily cite all the, the things that our previous speakers cited or that other people will cite today. This is just me. I'm just going to take a stand. I just plant my feet and I say, here's what I believe. I assert these things. It is my assertion that we have a purpose, that you have a purpose, that the human civilization has a purpose, that life itself has a purpose. I break that down into what I call three principles. The first one is to protect and expand the domain of life. Forgive the term, but I out trump the greens with this. We out trump the greens. In other words, what I'm saying is it's not enough just to save the mother world. We have to do more. We have to expand the life of this world to places that are now dead. I believe that's our mission. Save the mother world and expand the domain of life into the solar system and beyond to places where there is no life. Why? I'm on team life. You know, I'm, I'm on team life. That's, that's the shirt I wear, right? We are life. Number two, to honor and evolve human civilization. What do I mean by that? I mean that we, we give human history the honor it deserves. We look at it as deeply as we can. We appreciate it. And then we try to move to the next level. Maybe in our case, literally the next level. You know, when we look back at history, well, look, I, I look at it this way. And how many minutes do I have, Julia? Make it, uh, make it three or four. Three or four hours? No, I'm kidding. Minutes. Minutes. <laughs> All right, look, the way I see it is we're lined up on the edge of the frontier. Um, those of us who are trying to open it, whether it's Elon or, 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 or Martin or, or the entrepreneurs I work with in my venture capital side of my life, et cetera, we're lined up on the edge of this frontier. In front of us is this amazing future. It's the future and the universe. It is this sort of undiscovered country of possibility as to what we can be. Behind us is everything we've done to get us to this point today and who we are. We look at this in a way now that we've never been able to in human history. Our science allows us to understand the archaeology, unlike the Romans, uh, you know, in the, uh, the years, let's say, a thousand, who, who looked around and thought Rome had been built by giants in the past. We can have a deep understanding. If you look at Me Too or uh, Black Lives Matter, what are those? Those are movements where other people are coming in and looking at the past from other dimensions and from other angles. And it all comes together in a way that we can begin to understand what it is we've done to this date, what we've done until now, what we've gotten right and what we've gotten wrong. And as we move out there, we can correct that. That's the first time in human history that's been available to us. The third principle of purpose is the fun one, actually. And that's to explore and experience everything there is. You know, whether you're a Christian, you know, who, who believes in the Old Testament that says where God looks at Adam and Eve basically and says, you know, I need you to go out and name all the things I've created. You know, which, by the way, is a rationale for me because they aren't all on this planet. So there's a mandate for the Christians there. I, I found one in the Quran, too, and there are others out there. The mandates are go out and experience me coming from God, the voice of the universe, whatever you want to call it. And that's what I believe. I believe by exploring and experience things, we create the universe. That was mentioned in the, the previous talk. We are the mechanisms, whether it's us or somebody else having the same webinar in a different form on the other end of the galaxy. We are the mechanism by which the universe becomes self-aware. And it's a heck of a lot of fun. And I'll end moving into that, that realm of conversation. 
our society today has tried several different kinds of experiments in the way it's structured. I don't see them working very well beyond a certain point. They've gotten us to where we are. I mean, you can't question what gets you to where you are. What you look at is where you are in the moment and what the next decisions you make are gonna to do to transform your future. And we have the possibility to create a magnificent future. Imagine a society that is defined by the moment of transcendence from where you are to where you will be. The crossing into the zone of chaos that is beyond certainty, or for many of us, simply getting off the freaking couch and putting down the remote, or taking off the VR headset, or putting down the game controller, and confronting a reality that is uncomfortable and allows us to grow into what we can become. Imagine a society that is based on that, rather than how many Teslas do you have? How many neighboring countries have you conquered? How much oil do you, how many shares do you have? Blah, blah, blah. What about the celebration of who we are, our art, our music, our culture? What about the celebration of the life of the world we come from? Our mother world, the amazing things that are out there. What about reaching outward and becoming who we can be? Imagine being a child in a future that is created in that way who can look back at the earth because they may well be out there and say, this is where I come from. This is the treasure. This is the mother world that has given us birth. The earth that is, because we're moving the industries off has now begun to recover back to the way she should be. And that could turn her head outward into the universe and say, this is where we're going. That's exciting. So in my belief, in the belief of those I work with it's very simple. We are here to go there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. This was a great and moving talk. I especially thank you for sharing uh, recollections of your moment of uh, between brackets, spiritual awakening, and uh, pointing to this, which is, I think, a common concept that we're exploring tonight, today for you, that uh, in the words of someone uh, way smarter than me, uh, we are a way for the universe to know itself so, in different words and uh, in uh, perhaps a slightly different senses. This is the key concept that um, everyone here is sharing one way or another. Now, maybe we have a couple of minutes left if uh, someone who wants to ask a question to Rick, uh, feel free to either speak up or use the text chat. I'm going to give you all a couple of minutes to think of a question to ask Rick. Yes. I, th I think I stunned them into silence. I don't hear anyone. I have a comment. <laughs> a comment, great. Oh, no, Rick, you reminded me of my propaganda I used to hand out in 92 for my band when we had gigs. I had printed out sheets of paper, trifold, that said it was clickbait. It said, save Mother Earth, get real. And then it went on to talk about how we need to save humanity. And obviously, you have to save the Earth to save humanity. <clears throat> yeah <Absolutely. laughs> we called it propaganda for some reason it is it's propaganda i mean you can put any word you can put any word you want on it it's it's branding it's marketing it's propaganda it's, it's just the truth but it ended up by you know going into the whole space migration is our only salvation thing of course right right and look you know uh, and by the way i know elaine a little bit <laughs> she's she a crazy child yeah, she happens to be the mother of my daughter, um, <laughs> who is brilliant and who we're doing all this for, as you are for your children. Um, you know, there are going to be some people who want to migrate. Uh, that's great. I, I, I use the words expand, um, grow. You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, use different words now when I speak to people. I used to use the word colony. Uh, then I moved to settlement, and now I'm using the words human communities or communities of life. 
uh, just so that more people can listen, going back to your propaganda comment, because, you know, if my words come out and you can't hear my words, then I'm not an effective communicator. And so I'm trying to open it up a little bit more, but yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is what we got to do. We got to get the word out. And by the way, we can't be betting on these rich people. You know, we have to start getting our act together um, as a community, as as groups. You know, and and putting maybe we maybe we come together together as groups. Uh, you know, you've heard of Asgardia. Whatever you may think of Asgardia, the point is they're uh, they're a group of people that share a set of beliefs and probably a pool of money. And at some point, maybe they can show up and buy a ship from Elon, you know, or something like that. Um, there, there, I hope other groups begin to shape up and, and form up like that so that we can go out there and do it um, and, and get out there. Any other questions for Rick or comments? It seems no, but uh, we had a nice transition to the next uh, speaker, who is Elaine Walker. Floor is yours, Elaine. <laughs> All right. So I'm uh, really ill right now. <laughs> I'm on DayQuil. So please forgive me. I just, uh, if I look awake, it's just an illusion of lights and makeup. So um, I, I'm going to actually, I've never done this before, but I'm going to just read. I typed out what I need to say because I was just like, I didn't even know if I could make it. <laughs> but I always make it. I don't think I ever missed a day of work. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna paste in some things to the chat just for fun. Maybe someone can buy my book, <laughs> but you can also just grab that PDF file for free. If you want my book for free, pass it out to your friends if they like it. I always figure, I notice this with music too. If you give it away for free, people will end up buying it anyway. Um, oh gosh. So, and then, oh, there's the book introduction and video. So if you're super lazy and you just want to sit back and listen to me talk the introduction, that'll probably, you'll, you'll know whether you want the book or not hearing that. <clears throat> so happy 50th Apollo anniversary, everyone. I guess we're in the last year of that, right? So that's hard to believe. It's hard to believe we're getting that old. <laughs> Um, so at the end of my talk, maybe if there's time, or you can just go to it, we'll see if there's time. I'll, I'll show a clip of something I did for the 40th anniversary when I was up in the high Arctic on Devon Island with the NASA Hot and Mars project. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about not necessarily music. I'm not, I, there were so many different things I wanted to talk about, but I finally just, I kept coming back to education in a way even though to me that sounds super boring i don't even know if i'd go to a talk about education but i just keep coming back to that and but it's all about just res getting uh humanity to resonate with the idea of space and i it just seems like it really needs to start young i mean anyone older than me it's probably too late anyway so uh okay so resonating with space how can we pull humanity into a more positive trajectory uh with a like an enlightened view no matter what their interests or goals are i mean like everyday people who are living their lives everyday kids who are attending school etc that person we've met who says how can we go to space when there's problems on earth how a large enough portion of humanity learn to have a future mindset or like an overview effect as frank white puts it without actually going into space we need a massive amount of people to get an overview effect so my short stock answer for those people is that well, we must go to space in order to solve all the issues of Earth. And, you know, that's just the extreme short answer. There's much better answers. So, you know, in space, we'll have to recycle most everything. We'll have to find novel ways of growing and preserving food and power generation and battery storage. And we'll need to master nature's ecosystems. We'll be basically living in enclosed ecosystems. Uh, Mars is far enough away to allow pockets of humanity to experiment with various socioeconomic systems, but in an extremely careful cooperative manner where literally everyone's survival is at stake. And a new culture will come out of it as well. 
So many things we do in space, of course, will benefit life on Earth. We know that. Uh, you know, just our short stint going to the moon and not even staying on the surface very long brought us all kinds of spin-offs. Water purification, space blankets, freeze-dried food, uh, you know, spin-offs return for how much? A billion economically annually or something. So that said, we can argue all those facts and figures. At like, like Rick said, we can make spreadsheets about all that stuff, but it can sound dry and there's counter arguments to all that. And who has time to think about all that? It's just not the kind of argument, that kind of argument rarely enlightens anyone who's not, you know, on the brink of being enlightened. So we obviously can't rely on Apollo happening every day, uh, having that inspiration right in front of us every day. But imagine if our culture could continually spin off curiosity in kids and even encourage a spiritual connection to the cosmos by the time they're young adults, then people wouldn't feel contrary to the idea of space exploration and space migration, colonization, settlement, uh, whatever I'm supposed to say. Uh, they would feel a connection and understand the purpose, whether or not they're directly involved or whether or not they want to go. Um, they would know that there is a purpose. And so why are these other people going to space or why are they talking about it? Well, there's a purpose. They've been raised that way. We're not gonna spiritually enlighten the entire planet anytime soon, but we can at least start with our children. So I got lucky with having a good childhood and quite a few things that inspired me. I was one years old during Apollo 11. There were, I don't remember it, <laughs> but <clears throat> there were Pioneer spacecraft and the Viking Mars landers and Omni magazine and Dad was always watching the original Star Trek. So, but even for me, it took until I graduated college to really get the space bug. <clears throat> so, uh, so what about other kiddos that don't get lucky? I mean, I don't, can we start earlier and more deliberately with the, this message? So I don't mean brainwashing, I mean inspiring and encouraging a positive mindset about humans literally feeling a connection with our cosmos and being a core part of our education, like that being a core part of our education curricula. So what is inspiring about our everyday grade school education? I wish Ellis would come say, what is inspiring? I mean, there are some things. Alice loves school, uh, but there's, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. Uh, so is it memorizing and regurgitating? Is it drills? Is it repetition? Is it learning to sit still? Uh, no, those things aren't that inspiring. So education is a super tough area to try to make change. You can't just waltz in and insist that lesson plans are changed. Um, people in committees work really hard on curriculum and outside ideas usually aren't welcome at all. So I talk to Alice's teachers and I suggest things and I've gotten some positive feedback and they'll let me come in and give some fun lessons. But if you want to make any major changes, you pretty much have to start your own private school. So for what it's worth, um, here's my take on things. Um, so I would love to upgrade how we teach math. I knew it was coming. Alice's favorite subject was math from the time she was in diapers up until first grade. And I knew it. I was going to watch it in real time. Them just killing that love of math. Well, um, for me, math is uh, personal and almost uh, spiritual, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, so arithmetic is important, but adults use calculators and mathematicians use math software. Uh, I still count on my fingers, but I have three published math papers. So all the drills, all the repetition, I don't know. It's not that inspiring. So. As an aside, I discovered how I can do math at age 50, and I, I think the type of math I can do would excite at least some young kids who have visual skills. So I do it all with my autistic brain in the form of visualizing and drawing pictures, and <clears throat> my husband works out the algebra. So we go back and forth, and it's super fun, and I always appreciated math because both my parents are math professors. But up until I realized I could visualize in that way, I didn't enjoy math at all. I still can't do algebra. It just looks like ants. 
So uh, like a lot of times I'll draw things because if there's like a lot of lines and complicated stuff going on, but for, for the simpler topological kind of math, I literally, I think way better with my eyes closed, like, you know, just complete darkness. And I uh, visualize the math and, and, you know, and shapes and stuff. And I literally say to myself every time, come on universe, universe, show me some answers. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm talking to the aliens or, you know, the cosmos itself, because it, it feels like it, the math that we do feels like physics, even though it's really simple lines and shapes. So it feels like the universe has the answers and it's just like laughing me in the face. And it's so silly. So uh, if that's not a spiritual feeling, a connection with the cosmos, I don't know what is. Um, so visual math would inspire kids, some kids who have that kind of way of thinking. And there's there's so many fun things they could be subjected to that would give them a feel for the magic of math and how it's connected to um, actual uh, the actual universe, uh, how things actually work. Um, so they, they basically just need to be inspired and not drilled. Um, and I think every lesson can come from the direction, like if there was just a base understanding that that a lot of lessons in school should come from that place of we are pieces of the universe and we're trying to build that mindset. So like in science, kids can be shown how vast the cosmos is, how tiny quarks are, and then there could, there's our own level of existence, like trees and water waves and lungs, and that can all be explained uh, quite easily with chaos dynamics and fractals on, on some level. So a super simple form of chaos theory, such as what I show in my book, could enlighten kids early on about how real physical world works on a number of levels, from plant growth to orbital dynamics to even economics. And chaos theory, dynamical systems, fractals, it can all be taught with just pictures. Uh, easy to understand pictures. And when they're older, it can be done with extremely simple algebra. It can be just super simple equation, like one equation with one feedback loop. Um, <clears throat> so like imagine if a science lesson started off with an overview of how large and vast the universe is. And that universe with the lowercase u means observable universe uh there's a horizon we can't see beyond so we have this spherical observable universe and ask the kids why would that be they won't know but they'll have to think about it why would we only be able to see a sphere of it why does it stop um what is the horizon that we can't see beyond uh, and universe with a capital U includes everything beyond that as well. And tell the kids, we don't even know if it goes on forever. We, or if it's weirdly looped around and, and finite, like living on the surface of a sphere, there's no edges, but it's finite, but it never ends. You would just keep going around and around. I think a lot of these things can be easy for little kids to grasp on some level, uh, and then some of them might really get a spark from it. Um, you know, how ask them how old is the or you know tell them how old the universe is, how old are modern humans? That would be something really <laughs> freaky for them to 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 think about. Uh, most people aren't subjected to that information until even adulthood. And then when they find these things out, like, you know, what a blip humans are in the vast length of, you know, the age of space or how big the universe is or whatever, they, they find this stuff out when they're adults and they may be a little bit blown away, but they're too busy to worry about it at that point. I mean, these things really need to, need to teach these things way earlier. So, Let's upgrade how we teach history and social studies. Yeah, I hear all kinds of 
lessons. Uh, so, I mean, let's make children feel good about being humans instead of what we're doing now, which is drilling messages of guilt into them. It's possible to learn about all the bloody wars while also learning about how we've improved on certain things. Uh, our progress towards being a loving space mindset civilization is an extremely bumpy curve, but most threads of humanity do trend in a more civilized direction as time passes. So, you know, and if you don't agree with that, just zoom out. Uh, so in large group behavior can also be explained by chaos theory. And in that realm, there's hardly such a thing as a smooth curve. So even in music class, most people know me as a musician. I hope. So when I taught electronic music in college for 10 years, I actively tried to get my students into a space mindset. So yeah, even in music class, it's possible. <clears throat> so I started out with lessons like uh, when I'm talking about how to, but what sound is. Oh, there's actually a lot of lessons in electronic music that could start out this way. Everything in the universe is a bunch of sine waves added, and it can all be demonstrated with a simple, like, sacred shape of a circle. So you can take a, like, a circle and then move the paper. Ugh. And make a sine wave. It's easier on a chalkboard. Um, and just that alone, just like, oh, a circle can make the sine waves, and then just sine waves added up makes all their DJ sounds. Just, you know, just that alone blows their mind. And, you know, and I, I talk about things in the universe that can be broken down into sine waves, like the light spectrum and whatever, stuff like that. Um, so, I tell, I told my students, uh, I'll show you how sine waves add and we can carve and shape them into sounds. And with that knowledge, you will make your awesome DJ music or your music for dance class or music to scare and amaze your parents. So quite a few students actually came to me after class to spark up a conversation about the universe, just cause I would always like sneak these things into my lectures and it would just get them thinking. And so we talked about the shape of the universe and even like humans going into space and aliens, all kinds of stuff. They would want to just come up to me after class and spark up a conversation because they never had a chance other than my class to like spark up that kind of a conversation with anyone. They, their friends would think they were crazy. So uh, imagine if the way they grew up, their friends wouldn't think they were crazy and that would be a normal conversation. Wouldn't that be great? So there's a quote by Maria Montessori that I really like. It's not enough for the teacher to love the child. She must first love and understand the universe. She must prepare herself and truly work at it. So I imagine a world where we have expanded our mental horizons to not just imagine Earth as our home, but the entire cosmos as our home. At the very least, I think we should include it and make it part of our mental landscape. So we humans are little pieces of the cosmos, after all. We need to get past the mindset of just preparing our children for a nine to five workforce. And quite frankly, it's hard to make that connection anyway in elementary and middle school. So we could be teaching big picture stuff at those ages, our place in the cosmos. What future, what future will humans create with virtual reality, brain implants, artificial general intelligence, robotics, and space migration all just right around the corner it can be great or things could get really cringy so our kids and grandkids will need to have proper grounding to have the mindset that they're self-aware pieces of the cosmos and the cosmos is a great mystery that calls on curiosity to be our driving force so this should be our core foundation of our education system so uh Part of my contribution to educating people in general into a space mindset is that I wrote a book called Matter Over Mind, Cosmos, Chaos and Curiosity. And I started thinking about such things in the mid 90s. I later debated my philosophy with people on YouTube and with the, the video reply function that no longer exists, sadly. Uh, 
<clears throat> I researched for many years and then finally published the book in 2016. So it was basically my entire adult brain in the form of a book. So uh, I wanted to solidify all my thoughts and how, how I could imagine this new way that we humans can conduct ourselves uh, for the sake of uh, longevity of our species. So the main theme of the book is that there's two lenses through which we can view the world. There's one that's an abstract view using our abstract mind um, where we categorize, draw conclusions and summarize. And it's more of a narrow focus. And <clears throat> often we have to use this to make sense of things and it's used to control and tame the world, you know, basically our abstract thought. And then the other lens is the natural world where we see the bigger picture, study the powerful patterns of nature uh, where it's we wonder and contemplate and it's I think this lens has more of a sense of humor in a way <laughs> it's hard it's hard to believe in that one paragraph but if you read the book I, you'll see what I mean um I think that education is far too heavily weighted towards the abstract and not the bigger picture um especially of the natural world bigger picture uh which the cosmos is included of course so I get into some nitty gritty, but with the opening and closing paragraphs of each chapter are meant to be inspirational. So if we have time, I can read just a little to give you a feel for it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time, but uh, okay. oh, uh, just, uh, mm, just read the shortest one, maybe, and then we move on. Let's see. I guess I'll read the curiosity. So, um, <clears throat> a curiosity can get lost in the busyness of life. It makes me wonder how, how many people out there, young and old in every culture have a great potential of curiosity, but remain bound up with the burden of surviving day to day. For others, survival may be easy enough, but the general distractions of life eat up the potential for greater mental capacity. There are famous stories where a common variety of curiosity is the punchline of the plot, such as Adam and Eve, Lot's wife, and Pandora. They portray the intense but fleeting and superficial side of curiosity. It isn't much different than when a tabloid is in view or a magazine is in someone's lap. It can be extremely hard to resist reading the headlines, but as soon as it is out of view, we all but forget about it. I find it surprising that some of the most seemingly important and widely read stories highlight only the superficial fleeting brand of curiosity there is a much more noble side of curiosity one that i hope will attract people to this philosophy i'm talking about the type of curiosity that got us humans out of the caves and into spaceships i'm referring to our wonderment about the meaning and origin of the universe and all other aspects of nature big and small about consciousness our ultimate potential as conscious beings Meaningful evolution happens when we seek out uncomfortable territory. And this is the case with both physical migration and challenging mental consideration. In some deep inner place, curiosity has been our driving force and our pilot light. The right brand of curiosity leads to all good things. All right. Thank you so much, okay. Elaine. That was... Uh... Interesting and moving presentation. By the way, uh, you spoke about one of the so many interesting things in your book about uh, chaos and fractals. Uh, to give everyone the idea of the beauty of fractal, the best, best thing you can do is to watch uh, these, uh, the Colors of Infinity film, which is on Netflix now, uh, run by Arthur C. Clarke himself. With uh, himself, with Benoit Mandelbrot, and all the big names of uh, fractal geometry of about 15 years ago. Things are very much evolved now. And uh, I wish to recommend everyone to read Elon, uh, Elaine's book. It's a great book. And also, uh, note in the chat that uh, Ricardo has shared. Uh, uh, his uh, paper on uh, Taylor and uh, Merge No Spheres. I have read this paper mm. and um, I'd also like uh, very much to recommend this uh, modern 
interpretation of uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin idea, which is, I think, uh, very much what he himself wanted to say. Uh, now we are in the time slot of uh, Frank White. So I'm going to say a few words about him and then a little surprise. Uh, I believe everyone is uh, familiar with uh, Frank, Wright, Frank White's book and the concept of uh, overview effect. That was uh, Frank's first book uh, published uh, like you know, 87, uh, long time ago, but has been through four different editions. This is the last one. The overview effect is this powerful, mind-changing and life-changing impact of uh, seeing the Earth from space, or in other words, identifying with the Earth. And this uh, was uh, a very, was a, is a very big factor in uh, promoting an attitude to take better care of the environment and uh, adopt environmental uh, policies that benefit the Earth or Gaia. Yeah. Uh, after uh, the overview effect and uh, some other books, Frank wrote this Cosma Hypothesis, which is one of uh, his last books. Uh, Cosma is uh, the same thing as Gaia, but this time applied to the whole universe. He says that we need to think about our exploration of space or evolution into the universe, as I prefer to say, would benefit the universe as a whole. And uh, Cosma is uh, the name that uh, Frank uh, gives to the personified whole universe. We need a more complete perspective, yet another overview, if you will. That's what Frank says, uh, referring to this that we might call perhaps uh, overview effect uh, 2.0. Frank extends James Lovelock's concept of Gaia, the living Earth, to the whole universe. The universe itself will become a living whole, and we are actively encouraged by, large, by uh, larger forces to expand beyond the Earth and help the universe become increasingly self-aware. According, uh, and uh, here again, this is a concept that uh, more or less all speakers have shared so far. I totally agree. According to Frank, we will create or become uh, part of the universal mind. So this is what I had prepared uh to uh one moment please let me stop sharing screen uh okay this was what i had prepared to discuss uh, frank's ideas as i told you he had a medical emergency uh, related to his wife who is in the hospital now but uh, just a few minutes ago he sent to me uh, the presentation that he intended to give, and I uh, haven't uh, even seen it yet. Uh oh, one moment. Uh, I'm shuffling different windows. I haven't even seen it yet, so I'm going to share it with you right away. Let's go together through what. Uh, Frank wanted to say. So now I don't see the controls anymore, but I hope you guys can see uh, Frank's presentation prepared for the Terrasense Space Day. Um, I'll just give you time to read his uh, slides because uh, mm, since I see the window with you guys, I cannot see them all myself. So I'm just going to shut up and leave the floor to Frank White. 
let's take 15 minutes, 15 seconds per slide. Oh yeah, that's very true. In July 20, 2022, very few people have experienced Apollo 11. Well, I have experienced it as, uh, mm, I, and I think that many people in the audience have also experienced it. For me, it was really a life-defining uh, event. I have been uh, desperately in love with space and the stars ever since. Yes, our uh, very beautiful, lovely little planet in an incredibly hostile space. And everyone is in the same boat. In fact, I very often think in terms of spaceship Earth. We are uh, the crew and uh, we must uh, take uh, uh, care of the spaceship itself. Uh, but not only the hardware of the engine, but also the life support system and the well-being of the crew, which is everyone. Beautiful views. And here is uh, what Frank says about the Cosma hypothesis. Give more to the universe than you take. Homo sapiens has an ecological purpose in the universe. It is becoming widely understood that we need a new philosophy of space exploration, development, and migration. Our uh, next steps becoming a multi-planetary species, which has major challenges, of course. And yes, we should have uh, a human space uh, program. You can read about this in Frank's books as a central unifying project for the whole of humanity. And everyone on Earth can join this great adventure. So I hope you have seen the presentation. I haven't seen it yet myself because I have a uh, part of the screen and used for this. Let me see who has written what in the chat. Okay, I think uh, uh, before uh, giving the floor to the next speaker, who is uh, Frank Tipler, we have uh, a few minutes. And uh, perhaps uh, if there is uh, any question for uh, Ricardo, Elaine, or Rick, that's the best time to do it. I completely share what Rick just said that Frank White is a beautiful soul. I have uh, a question for Ricardo. Ah, no, let's give priority to Martin. Martin would like to ask each of the three last speakers how they would recommend we best implement Frank White's ideas. Great question, and who wants to go first? Rick. 
Oh, I was actually trying to hand it off. That was me handing it off. Um, I think, you know, there's a huge amount of overlap. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled about what's happening with the people that are uh, trying to get more and more people to experience the overview effect by getting them out into space. Uh, to me, that's not sufficient. There's a lot more work we have to do if we're going to open the frontier to people to actually go and do the things we've spoken about this morning. Um, the, the one thing is, is, not, um, is not to get passive. Uh, what I've seen in, in the space move, there is no space movement anymore. Uh, there was for a little while. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, there's some organizations, there's uh, some rich people and a lot of entrepreneurs that I get to work with, the, the pleasure of working with. Um, there's no movement right now. Um, there are fans. Um, there are people who celebrate these things. Uh, there are groups that are trying to buy people tickets to go. Great, all great. Uh, but at the same time, there, there's no um, non-corporate, in other words, or non-private sector uh, organizations or groups that are out there making sure that the hard work gets done, the dirty work. Um, we did it back in the 90s with the Space Frontier Foundation, where we would, um, if NASA was going the wrong way, we we fought them, you know, and um, or in your own countries, where, wherever you're from, um, you have to take a stand. We, we can't just hug our way to space. You know, it, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I have the split personality. I love to focus on the big, big, big pictures. But at the same time, we have to be able to, to fight and, and stand up. Right now, we have this, uh, and I'll, I'll be quiet about this in a second, but this is a thing for me, and that is that uh, here in the U.S., we have the the uh, Artemis, which uh, NASA is holding out that we're going to go back to the moon and all. Um, or, or as I think of it now, the art of misdirection. Uh, because uh, I was at an event a few weeks ago at NASA, um, and they showed their plan. And they hope to actually be able to have up to four astronauts stay for 30 days at a time on the moon by 2034. That's what, 60 or 70 years since Apollo, we're actually, which they did, you know, starting from a cold start in about eight years. We're gonna have people on the moon, government people who can stay there, government employees who can stay there for a month. That's not good enough. It's not fast enough. It does, it, it does, it's not exponential, it's not scaling. Um, and so we have to lean on uh, things like that, or what I call the Senate launch scam, which is the, the big rocket. Um, it's easy as space people to get so excited, like, oh, look at the beautiful pictures of sunrise at Cape Kennedy, and there's the Senate launch vehicle standing there. Isn't that amazing? And I see this stuff on my LinkedIn and Facebook and stuff. No, it's, it's disgusting. It's a complete ripoff. It's taking the dreams we're all taking about, uh, talking about, and pushing them um, into support for corporations and people who are have no interest in doing what we want to do. That's the one side. The other side is we get lazy, and we're like, oh well, Jeff and Elon have it handled. Yeah, they're going. Hey, I'm going to join the Elon fan club. You know. You know, let me, uh, Rick, uh, uh, yeah. uh, let me interrupt you. Please. Yeah, go ahead. I was on a roll. Yeah. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we can continue by email anyways. So let me ask Elena to yeah. answer Martin's question. <laughs> Rick can speak for all of us when I'm sick. So, yeah, gosh. Uh, one thing that I was going to say frustrates me, but I don't know. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I, I wasn't involved in a lot of the Space Frontier Foundation and National Space Society in, in the 90s as well. And, and Rick, maybe they were doing such great things then because you were their leader. <laughs> what you, it's not a no great mystery why that might have trailed off. Anyway, but you know, I went to so many space conventions back then, like late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> Saw lots of slideshows. Uh, and, and like, <clears throat> then along came Elon Musk, 
<laughs> Rick, I don't even remember what that conference was, but he was talking about planting a flower on Mars. It looked like like Belle, like Beauty and the Beast rose, and everyone was laughing at him. What was that? I, it was in it was in L.A., but I can't remember what year. Anyway, uh, and. And I'm like, okay, great. So then no, there's Elon Musk, you know, and then there's this whole space community. And then uh, I, you know, I've, I was going to the Haunt and Mars project every year. And but, so, okay, here's my frustration. It seems uh, kind of almost piecemeal. Like there's all these amazing people actually doing things, but they're not working together. Uh, maybe that's okay. Uh, like, so for example, Elon Musk is not paying any attention whatsoever to all the details we need to know to actually live there. So that's where I say, okay, Alice's other god, her godfather, uh, Pascal Lee from the Haunt and Mars Project, they're doing a million, um, I posted the playlist in the chat, you can look at it, tons and tons of research, detailed research every year on the, in the high Arctic of how to actually live there and work there and function and not die, um, like traverse planning and stuff. But I'm almost horrified to say, Pascal thinks we should just have research stations on Mars. So there's that. So that worries me. Um, I don't know. I could go on and on, but how eh, they're not. It's. I, I wish there could be a more holistic understanding of what you know. Now that we have these amazing people doing stuff, can they kind of um, get their their plan together, even though they're not working together at all. You know, I know they all tried. That's the other frustration. You know, there's the Mars Society and then the Pascal, the NASA on Mars project. They never get along. Why can't they get along? Like, it would be so much better. They're right next door. On, they can't even get along. And they're both on Devon Island right next to each other. So. <laughs> Thank you, Irina, actually. I was going to do a talk on that, but I thought, no, yeah, I'm way that's... too tired to work that out. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, I think uh, uh, that uh, Elon Musk is not uh, doing too much uh, for uh, life support and health issues in space. I think no sense not, to him. Uh, he's doing the rockets, so it's I'm... not uh, really a big problem as long as other people do it, which, uh, as you say, is happening. Uh, thanks. Now, Ricardo, you have uh, exactly two minutes to answer uh, Martin's very critical question: What should we do to implement? Uh, Frank White's ideas. Perdo, I think uh, you should unmute your microphone. No, uh, we see your lips moving, but we are not hearing you. Okay. Uh, okay, okay uh, Ricardo, uh, raise your hand if uh, something in your system is not working and you cannot speak. Huh? Is anyone hearing Ricardo or is it just me? No. I can't hear him. Could you maybe do a pantomime? No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> No, okay. Uh, let's uh, give uh, Ricardo time to recover the function of his microphone, and let's uh, give uh, the floor to the last speaker. And uh, it's uh, really a honor to welcome Frank Tibler, who doesn't need any introduction. And by the way, it's not the first time. Uh, Frank uh, speaks at the Terrasen event. I think you participated in the very first one in uh, 2005. Ancient history. Ancient history. Frank, but you can hear yours. me. That's what I yes, wanted we to can. Check. Yes, <laughs> we can. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to actually answer the uh, question, uh, Frank White. I actually, I answered it in my uh, book published in 1994, The Physics of Immortality, um, which incidentally, I give a proof in the mathematical appendix, um, which has been known by mathematicians, oh, about uh, 75 years, that chaos really does not exist in the actual universe because uh, it is not allowed in quantum mechanics. Now that's really interesting. Quantum mechanics changes the picture enormously. 
What I argued in Physics of Immortality is that it is inevitable that the human race will, are more precisely our descendants, we have to put this in enormous temporal perspective, will expand off this earth and engulf not only the nearby stars, not only the galaxy, but ultimately engulf the entire universe and take control over the entire universe and guide its future evolution. Now, in my book, I assumed as a, as a postulate that intelligent life would come into existence and never die out in the universe and investigate what the consequences of that were and see how the physical laws would allow that. But since then, I've been able to prove using the laws of physics that this actually must occur. The three assumptions you need on this is first of all, black holes exist. Um, there are strange objects, these black holes, I should be more precise, astrophysical black holes. Um, they certainly exist. We've seen thousands of these things out there. The second fundamental postulate that you have to have is that quantum mechanics, or more precisely, a fundamental postulate of quantum mechanics, the technical term is unitarity, and being a mathematician, I just like to use these mathematical words. One way to think of unitarity is information conservation. The third law that you need is the second law of thermodynamics, that the entropy of the universe can never decrease. We've known about the second law, its validity since about roughly the middle of the 19th century. Given black holes exist, quantum mechanics is true, the second law of thermodynamics holds, you can then prove that the universe um, will ultimately be taken over by intelligent life and intelligent life will guide us into the final singularity, which by the way, you can also prove using those things those three laws must actually exist. Now, what I'm going to do is go through briefly the argument. If you want the full mathematical details, um, you will have to go either to Physics of Immortality, its scientific appendix, or to my various published papers, um, Quantum Mechanics, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences 2014, um, the full omega point theory, which is the description of the future of the universe and how intelligent life will ultimately take it over, was published in Reports on Progress in Physics in 2005 in one of the conferences which Martin organized in 05. Um, I actually gave him an off print of that copy. I'm sure, Martin, you have misplaced it by this time. Um, but the proof is still out there. And the point is, even if we individuals fail, inevitably um, intelligent life will proceed out from this planet and engulf the entire universe. Now, I want to put um, emphasize that we cannot conclude for the extreme far future that it will be Homo sapiens that will actually do the colonization. Um, I think we need to put all of this in perspective, and I can recommend that you read this important book. I don't know if you can see it, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. This is my own copy. And toward the end, Darwin writes, and I think he is absolutely correct, judging from the past, we may safely infer that not one living species will transmit its unaltered likeness to a distant futurity. And of the species now living, very few will transmit progeny of any kind to a far distant futurity. I think that's profoundly true. And we have to put it all in perspective that ultimately we will be replaced by our mind children, and Hans Baravik called them artificial intelligences. I rather doubt if any humans will ever engage in interstellar uh, travel or colonization. We may engage in colonizing some of the plant, uh, planets of the solar system, but I rather doubt it because we humans are evolved to exist in a 
um, oxygen atmosphere, uh, a, a liquid water um, environment, and we are not fitted, here we're thinking Darwin here, to really colonize space. The AR, AIs are, and I think they will do the colonization. But I point out in physics of immortality that the AIs will have the power in the extreme far future to bring us back into existence um, as virtual reality creations recreate the entire earth is in virtual reality. I discuss how that's possible, what the laws of physics will allow that in the technical appendix of my book, The Physics of Immortality. But let me now give you a proof that we will take over, or rather, once again, our descendants will eventually take over the entire universe and uh, guide it. All right, well, let's see if now I can actually pull this stuff up. All right, let's see. Okay, I'm hoping you're seeing this. It's very top physics of the omega point theory. Are people seeing this? I don't hear any answers. Okay, I see one thumb up, so you're seeing it. Yes, okay. Frank, we are seeing it. And we love listening to you too. Okay, thank you, Marty. Okay, now I'm starting with the fact that black that astrophysicals black holes exist. We've seen all of these. Now here is where it gets interesting. Everything else, given those postulates, I said, quantum mechanics, black holes exist, and um, the second law of thermodynamics holds. Everything else is just mathematics, but I'm going to outline in words the, the mathematics. One of the fascinating things that was proven by Hawking is that black holes evaporate. He also showed that if black holes were to completely violate that com evaporate completely, they would violate unitarity. Now, um, if the universe were to actually expand forever, black holes would completely evaporate, and Hawking proved that too, thus violating unitarity. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Unitarity, once again, another way of saying it's conservation of information, is a fundamental property of quantum mechanics and cannot therefore be violated. Conclusion, the universe cannot expand forever. And the only way this can happen is for the universe to end in a final singularity. As I said, I could expand on that in an entire hour lecture, why it has to be, the expansion has to be terminated by a final singularity, but I'm going to avoid that now. I can go in more detail if you would like later. Here's another interesting fact. Jacob Bekenstein, great Israeli physicist, showed that if event horizons exist as the final singularity is approached, then the entropy of the universe would have to approach zero. And so the entropy of the universe would have to decrease from whatever it is today. But the second law of thermodynamics, remember, tells us the entropy of the universe can never decrease. Conclusion, event horizons cannot exist. A space-time that has no event horizons has a final singularity that is a single point in the Penrose seat boundary to, uh, topology. Sorry about these technical terms, but I have to show where the word Omega point theory is actually coming from. I call such a space time with a single um, point in the C boundary topology of Penrose an omega point space time. And the theory of such a space time is therefore called simply the omega point theory. Now, I have shown you can find the proof in the appendix, technical appendix of physics and environmentality, that uh, an omega point space-time is necessarily spatially closed. So that answers the previous speaker's uh, question. Is the universe infinite or is it uh, finite? It is finite without boundary, follows directly from the second law of thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. Okay, once again, the bottom line, which I started this talk with, the omega point theory follows from three assumptions. Astrophysical black holes exist. Quantum mechanics, 
Unitarity, also known as information conservation, is true. Three, the second law of thermodynamics is true. It's often said, of course, that the second law of thermodynamics is the enemy of life. No, the second law of thermodynamics is life friend, and it's what is driving life. It is what is ensuring that life will make it all the way into the final singularity, which incidentally, as I show in Physics of Mortality, is infinitely far away in experiential time. I call it subjective time in the book, but it's the time we actually experience. I think since the evidence for these three facts are, is overwhelming, we have to accept the omega point theory. Now, what does this have to do with space travel, which is what we are actually talking about? And what does it have to do with uh, us, our descendants more precisely? Um, engulfing the universe? Well, um, as I've said before, it also implies that our AI ascendants, that's what I think will really do the exploration, will one day ex expand out from the earth, engulf the entire universe, and survive all the way into the omega point, controlling the evolution of the entire universe. Now here, how do I prove that that actually has to happen? Well, I use a theorem that was proven, published in Nature oh, about 40 years ago by the great uh, Scottish physicist, uh, Malcolm McCallum. He showed that unguided elimination of event horizons, remember event horizons have to be eliminated, um, otherwise the second law of thermodynamics is not true is of measure zero in the initial data of general relativity. This means that were the universe to be unguided in the far future, eliminations of event horizons would itself violate the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the crucial word in this is unguided. In physics of mortality, I showed that intelligent life, if it is to continue to survive as you are approaching the final singularity, has to eliminate the event horizons. Elimination of the event horizons in essence provides the energy source, the unlimited energy source that they need in order to survive um, all the way into the final singularity. Conclusion, and this is the basic conclusion that I want to uh, cover, is the omega point theory um, implies that life goes on forever. Now, that's the basic summary of the, the talk. But now what I want to do is to ask a question, how exactly will our uh, successors um, expand out from the Earth and engulf uh, the entire um, universe? Now, um, one of the things we have to put in perspective is rocket technology. Um, we haven't actually made much progress in uh, the last century in rocket technology. The V-2 rocket, the first true uh, space traveling rocket, used as a World War II weapon, unfortunately, had a specific impulse of 200. Now, specific impulse um, is uh, a measure of the efficiency of rockets. The Saturn um, V, main booster, first booster, um, had a specific impulse of around 300, so 50% more. The Raptor engine, Elon Musk, we've mentioned him before today, um, has around uh, a specific impulse of 400. The best chemical rocket that we've got, the last stage of the European uh, space launching vehicle, has a specific impulse of around 500. 200 to 500 in the last century. What is the specific impulse, the ultimate specific impulse allowed by the laws of physics? The answer is 30 million. 30 million, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can all agree is a bit much more than 200 to 500. So we've got a quite a way to go. But the question is, how would this um, ultimate um, engine actually work. Now, I have, I want to call your attention to um, a, um, another slide. You've all seen this, and let's see if I can pull it up on my share screen. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's see. 
Here is what I want to show you guys. And let's see if you remember it. Remember this? Back to the future? Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going, we don't need roads. This is the The guy who made this uh, uh, imaging, computer imaging, couldn't imagine a real rocket, but he does. Uh, let me pull it back, this particular piece right here. Notice that it's off the pavement, but you don't see any rocket exhaust. That's what we, we really like. Now, maximum specific impulse is obtained by having an exhaust which moves at roughly or very as close as possible to light speed. Photons would do that. That's what we're seeing apparently as this uh, um, flying car takes off. But right here, you're seeing the car lifted without any um, a rocket of exhaust visible. That would be the best possible rocket exhaust. Neutrinos. They have essentially zero mass, slight mass, but essentially zero. Neutrino, anti-neutrino pairs shooting out the best back end of the rocket would give you a specific impulse arbitrarily close to 30 million. There's another part of uh, Back to the Future that I would like uh, to show you guys. I think is another fun thing. Shows you what we would really like if we had an ultimate um, power source. Watch this. Where? Back to the future. Wait a minute. What are you doing, Doc? I need fuel. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is the ideal fuel source. Garbage. Turning garbage into um, propulsion or energy. That's what we would all love. The question is, do the laws of physics permit such things? The answer to both questions is, may surprise you, yes, in principle, given the laws of physics, we should be able to do that. Now, how would that work? All cosmologists, myself included, are convinced that there was a process in the very early universe which was creating matter rather than antimatter. Now, we, it necessarily violates baryon number and lepton number. Baryons um, are examples. Oh, that would be uh, protons, um, neutrons, baryon number plus one. Leptons, electrons. Now, the standard model of particle physics, which has been tested in the laboratory by every and confirmed by every experiment we may have able to throw against it, over uh, the uh, past oh, 50 odd years has a natural mechanism that will by violate lepton number and um, baryon number. B minus L is cons conserved, but if you actually understood the principle underlying this, you could convert um, garbage, plenty of baryons and leptons there into energy. Now, what we don't know is, is the standard model, the ultimate theory that really explains how this works. My colleagues have been dubious about that because they have assumed that in the extreme early universe, you had thermal equilibrium. In order for this baryon process at work, any process, it has to be out of thermal equilibrium. Now, I have made a proposal published in 05. That was the uh, um, preprint that I gave you, Martin. It contains the details of how this actually works, um, how the standard model can actually, if it has a particular property, the background radiation has a particular property in the very early universe, that it would naturally um, generate um, matter and no antimatter. Now, if that property of the background radiation persisted into um, current times, then it would actually have a observational consequence in if you were to measure the um, background radiation today. Now, let me show you of uh, differences, how this would work. Here we are. 
All right, let's see. Can you see that picture, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, oh, we you do. See? You yes. do, okay. Now, I hope you can see a difference between these two curves. Um, the top picture is if my colleagues are right and there is no way to generate uh, baryons rather than anti-baryons, um, you will see, you can see a difference. There are two peaks here. Now, if the background radiation had the properties I predicted to have, then you would see a slightly different picture. Can you see any difference between the two curves? I hope it's obvious what the two differences is. I'm going to emphasize it. These peaks, these two peaks are reproduced, same, same position. What you're doing is you're looking at intensity of radiation from the background radiation, from the background versus uh, frequency from about, oh, seven to 13 gigahertz. Okay, now here, you see the two pictures, but you also, two peaks, but you also see a little peak here and two minima here. Now, um, that is what in principle you could uh, see. And let's see if I can, I'll just eliminate that. All right, now, um, I managed to get funding to do the experiment from the IT billionaire, uh, Peter Thiel, and we built uh, the apparatus. And let me show you a picture of the apparatus. And let's see if I can now close this and show a split screen again. Okay, here we are. Okay, here's the constructed apparatus. Now, most of this stuff is just screens to keep off the signal for the nearby mountains. This is the key part of the apparatus right here. And not shown is an electronics laboratory uh, that will analyze this. All right. And now let me show you the piece de resistance, namely the result of the experiment. All right. All right, let's see if I can pull it up here. Okay, now here is standard theory at the very top. Here is what the background radiation would look like if this baryon mechanism is, uh, is predicted by the standard model, uh, operated in the early universe and has a remnant today. Now here is what we actually see. Now. I hope you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that um, an actual instrument won't give you a nifty curve uh, exactly as theory predicts, particularly when you're um, using crude instruments, which unfortunately uh, we had to use. But I think the signal of uh, the actual mechanism of creation is actually coming through. In other words, the property that the universe would have to have in order for this mechanism that allows us ultimately to convert garbage into energy and to a space drive, rocket drive, actually exists. So I think that the evidence is pretty clear that it's good. Unfortunately, we're not ready to publish this. I didn't speak about this here. You didn't hear this from me. Um, but um, let's see if I can get back now. Uh -huh. And the reason is, um, unfortunately, let's see, there we go. Okay, I should be back, hopefully I am. Okay, um, the reason we've not been able uh, to uh, release this data, we've got the signal, by the way, I just showed you one nifty picture. Uh, we've done the experiment over and over again and done checks to make sure that we're not seeing an extraneous signal. I'm not going to bother you with the details, but we've not been able to publish because there is one more little check that we want to perform. And unfortunately, given the location of the instrument, we get only about one observation uh, time per year. The weather is just too bad. It's not here in New Orleans, it's actually in Pennsylvania, but La Nina, for the last two years has shut down the observations in um, 
Pennsylvania, and it looks like that the observations will be shut down again this year. The only way to uh, move up the, uh, to, 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 we may have be able to publish two years from now if, if La Nina disappears, but um, we can't afford to uh, move the observatory. It costs a quarter of a million dollars, which we don't have. Okay, so I think that the um, mechanism whereby our descendants, the AIs, which is what I think will be uh, the main colonizers of the universe, um, will use is this sort of rocket that is propelled um, by the annihilation of matter into energy using the standard model um, process. Okay, that's roughly what I wanted to say. So I'll open myself to any questions that you may have. Oh, hi, Frank. Um, <clears throat> I apologize, I was fading out in the beginning. <laughs> and then I woke up when I heard you say Penrose. How related is any of this to the Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology? Uh, Roger is in, he rejects the standard model. He also right, rejects- but, what, what, what you're saying is what you're, was anything you were saying um, towards the beginning of your talk related to CCC, to, to no, Roger Penrose's- Nothing, nothing. Nothing, okay. If Roger is right, then I'm wrong. But remember, Roger oh. is, he knows what he's doing. He's a genius, he's no fool. He's explicitly rejecting the laws of physics. He says so, you read his book, I've got his book. Um, let's see, it, to some extent it's covered in here, the road to reality, but um, I don't know if I have his uh, actual conformal uh, book on the table. No, I don't think, I must have left it at home. But um, basically Roger, I've known, he's been a friend uh, for 40, 50 years. Um, and he really? does not really understand the standard model. Um, he does not, uh, the, the term conformal geometry almost tells you that. That's massless. He, he's well known, he knows what he's doing. He wants to be, um, uh, use massless geometry, but the essence of the standard model um, is mass. Um, something like 25 uh, parameters in the standard model. Of those, only three refer to the massless fields. The other um, 22 refer to the Higgs, uh, which generates mass, and also um, how the Higgs interacts with the, uh, the other particles. Um, so he explicitly rejects the standard model. He also rejects the singularity. Um, he is still trying to get horizons. Um, that's an, uh, I've not to have any interaction with him on, in recent years. I'm more isolated down here in New Orleans. But uh, so I, uh, he was told that the background radiation actually disagrees uh, with his observations. And this is, mm. my experiment also disagrees with the entire experiment. I thought he we found something in there. The, I'm sorry? I thought he found something in the background radiation. They said it's an anomaly. Now, oh. I have not looked at that. I suspect it is because I noticed that one of his points, which he, he indicates uh, is an anomaly, happened to agree with the um, um, ultra high energy cosmic ray uh, spectrum. There seems to be an anomaly of uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays coming from that, but they would be a purely local, i.e. within a gigaparsec, not part of the uh, uh, cosmos itself. Now, um, I had a student look at that and uh, he could not reproduce the ultra high energy cosmic ray um, anomaly. And uh, the data unfortunately has disappeared, so we can't check that. Um, but I do know that uh, other experts in the um, background radiation saying that what he was seeing there was just an anomaly. Oh, darn. Okay. And also, As I are you said, familiar uh, my, with exper Tarot? my experiment explicitly contradicts this whole theory. I mean, I didn't want him to be 100% right, because I actually think it's, it's a little different than what his model is. Uh, so I, I like how his time. kind of, so basically his, it when, when the universe gets thinned out as much as possible, it becomes indistinguishable from being squished as much as possible or whatever. So there's some bridge where it all starts over, right? No, no, you want the universe to be squished. You want a final singularity. 
That's what enables us to survive forever. Right. And, and, and Roger's and, and Roger theory, Penrose's thing his theory is, that, is a cyclic time theory. He's he that's in his the title of his book. I exact I forget it's not Wheel of Time, which is another science fiction fantasy uh, um, cyclic time theory. But his is a cyclic time theory. Now the problem right, right. Was, so that the thinned out version of the universe becomes mathematically indistinguishable from the the uh, singularity. So then it just all starts over. No, no, Forget what size is something it is and then it starts over. Singular singularity. See, he's going to try to uh, smear out the singularity. He's an expert in formal yeah. techniques. Yeah, um, I, I, I love is, formal math. So that's no, 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 no. Think about think about this is the crucial point. Okay. His theory is a cyclic time theory. Now, cyclic right. time means we're all dead because right. inevitably the future is the same as the past. So there has to be a maximum achievement. And well, it then would be a new universe, so it might be released. slightly different every time, I think. No, no. It's, if it's slightly different, it's not cyclic. Slightly okay. different, it has to be exactly the same, but it's not truly cyclic. Now, in the Omega Point Theory, which, as I said, Oh, Roger also rejects the second law. That's another uh, thing why he can, why we disagree. I mean, if you reject enough laws of physics, then you can get whatever you please. Um, he explicitly says this. He also rejects unitarity. So remember, he, he likes black holes. He should. He got the Nobel Prize for uh, helping discover them. But he <laughs> rejects, and this is very explicit. He knows what he's doing. He's a genius. He doesn't make mathematical mistakes. He rejects unitarity and he rejects the second law of thermodynamics. If you reject the second law, you reject unitarity, you can't prove the omega point theory. Gotcha. I depend on the laws of physics. They're in all the textbooks. They've, every experiment we've done so far confirms them. But if you reject them, well, you can get anything. But I want to focus on what's more important. Suppose the second law is wrong, by the way, if you have a cyclic time, obviously the second law can't hold. The second law explicitly says entropy can never decrease. But if the future is the same as the past, obviously it attains a maximum and then decreases. So from my point of view, the really important thing is that with the final singularity and life making it all the way into the final singularity, Life literally exists forever in experiential time and furthermore grows to infinite knowledge. There's a real infinity there. Whereas in any cyclic cosmos, everything is finite and the universe is pointless. A cyclic cosmos was actually investigated by, of all people, William Shakespeare. Ever heard of that guy? Heard of his play Macbeth? That was a, a play in which Mac Shakespeare was a great, great author. He was also philosophically very deep. In, Ma in uh, Macbeth, he was investigating the notion of a cyclic time. In the end, he concludes, in the words of his character Macbeth, life in such a universe is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I agree totally that if life is to make sense, it has to go on without limit, literally without limit, into infinity, which is where it will be at the omega point. So Roger wants to wipe us all out. He doesn't realize this. He hasn't followed the full logic of his own si system. But the logic of a cyclic universe was worked out centuries ago. Buddhism. The whole theory of that religion is based on the idea of a cyclic cosmos. Buddha correctly pointed out that if we are recycled over and over again, well, we start as a bug, then we make as a human, then we become a god. Uh-oh, since it's a cyclic cosmos, we get back to a bug. What's the point of all this? You want to get out of these damn cycles. You want to reach nirvana. Exactly. You do not want a cyclic cosmos. Fortunately, we have something Buddha did not have. We have, ladies and gentlemen, the laws of physics, the second law of thermodynamics, telling us that life will literally go on forever and we are not locked into a cyclic cosmos. Thank you. Um, I have to leave in like one minute. <laughs>
So I just want to say thank you for having me since I have to run out. Thank you very much, Elaine. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take okay. care. And I had a quick question for Frank Tibler. Have you heard of Neil Turok and his dual universe? But I I'm need an answer in like 10 seconds. That's particular one I haven't heard. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye, Elaine. Bye. See you soon. Okay. Well, Frank, uh, oh, I had a quick question. Yes. First of all, I love your talk. I love your style. And it just reminds me of, uh, you know, being in the room with like Jerry Purnell or Bob Fulward or, or you know, the greats. And, and I just really want to thank you for that. Uh, the enthusiasm combined with the knowledge. Um, now, of course, those guys were science fiction writers. You're you're a reality guy. Uh, it seemed early on what you were saying is that some sentient whatever will live forever, etc. Then the question really boils down to who, right? So it's sort of a, a little bit more complicated. Go ahead. Um, because see, I'm arguing um, that life, intelligent life, first appears in a very limited part of the cosmos. Um, depending on the details of how the cosmic acceleration works, um, they, they, it could be more out there. But in my original book, I argued for just one. And I was basing that on the evolutionist opinions. Um, Francisco Ayala, one of the great evolutionists of the 20th century, gave me a number that Given an Earth-like planet, the probability of intelligent life evolving on that planet in its entire history before its sun leaves the main sequence is about 10 to the minus 1 millionth power, which means um, it can only occur uh, once in the universe. Now, um, not being an evolutionist, I like to use physics arguments. And if there were more than one intelligent species out there, they would use up the energy available um, a little too fast. Now, I go into more detail how that works in physics of immortality, but that's why I'm dubious that there are very many intelligent species out there. So we are the ones who will start the game, we humans. Now, in your talk, you were worried about uh, the loss of uh, enthusiasm uh, for space. Now, as a physicist, I am familiar with the phenomena that we physicists do not invent things, we discover them. And if we fail, individual physicists, me, for example, fails to get the idea out, no problem, some later physicists will discover it after me. I can give, I could give hours of lectures about how this happened in physics. But the bottom line is that physics is out there to be discovered. If I fail to either discover it, I have discovered it, but I haven't gotten, I haven't persuaded all my colleagues that I'm right yet, needless to say. Um, but um, if I fail, some other physicists will eventually discover it. The same is true for space travel, that if we right now fail to get out of your space, some, some of our descendants will succeed where we fail. Our motion into space is inevitable. All we can do is to speed up when the inevitable happens. Now, I like to put it in the perspective of science. Marcio Russo, a physicist at the University of Rome, in his book, The Forgotten Revolution, argued that Aristarchus of Samos succeeded in convincing the astronomers of the time that the Earth was the third planet from the sun, and the sun is the true center of the solar system. And heliocentric theory, in other words, started then. Alas, it was suppressed by the Roman government. Now, whether that's true, he presents arguments in his book, The Forgotten Revolution, that it is true. The certainly Aristarchus, we know, presented the heliocentric theory at the time, around the 200 BC, but it failed to take hold for whatever reason. It was rediscovered by Copernicus, published in, in um, uh, 1543. And then the scientific revolution took off. 
The scientific revolution, if Rousseau is right, could have taken off in 200 BC, and we would have had the science that we had today by 200 AD. So we would have skipped that thousand odd years of human misery had it taken off then. That's what we can do in encouraging space travel now. Inevitable is space travel. It's going to happen no matter how, what effort is made to stop it. What we can do is get it to occur now rather than later and have it obvious that human beings are going to survive forever. Remember that it may be AIs on the short run. They may even exterminate us. You know, or Elon Musk is worried about that. But the crucial thing to keep in mind is that the AIs will know the physics I know, which means that they will know they will that if they wipe us all out, they can bring us back in the far future. They will know that. So they will think of us, if they decide to wipe us out, as putting us on ice for a few trillion years while they sort everything out. Remember, they can bring us back in virtual reality near the final state, never to die again. I worked this out in detail in Physics of Immortality. So although the AIs may lead the eventual expansion into interstellar space, in the far future, we'll be back. Okay. So it's immortality, not only of the of the entire biosphere and descendants, but individual human beings. Yeah, I guess I'm basically uh, obviously impatient um, and uh, concerned about external uh, checkmates. You know, the asteroid coming in, the mishandling of the climate, whatever it is, so that we are past those points. I actually have a T-shirt that has the dinosaur on it, you know, and it says uh, asteroids, God's way of asking how that space program was coming, you know, uh, that kind of thing. It's really just a, for me, I, I, I agree with you, essentially. It's just a matter of want to do it now as quickly as possible and want to do it before something else takes us out. Because as you're saying, I think what you're saying is if we get taken out, some other sentient being will do it. Yes. Yeah, I just, I'm, like I, I said, think, no, I think we'll do it because I think we're so close. Yeah, I don't yeah. think there's time for an asteroid to take us out. I think uh, that uh, the universe has put all of its uh, chips on us. I hope so. Great talk. I can't prove that, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Do we have other questions for Frank? Not that I can see, so I'll give you time to think of one more and uh, ask one myself. We had this uh, talk by Ricardo Camp earlier today about the ideas of uh, Pierre Taylor de Chardin, of whom you have also written. Now, uh, taking into account the fact that um, he was working uh, several decades ago, so he didn't know as much science as we know today. And uh, also taking into account the fact that uh, he did not much physics because he was not a physicist. Do you think the general spirit of his work points to kind of uh, the same direction as uh, your idea, and perhaps the fact that you both use the term uh, omega point, uh, say, say something about that. Well, I have a discussion of my relationship with Teilhard in Physics of Immortality. Um, now, I don't think it was an accident that I used the term omega point um, to refer to the final singularity because I was aware of Teilhard's work at the uh, in, in the various future, um, uh, we will have God, which is uh, he called the Omega point. Um, now, it is interesting that um, one of, you can describe the singularity. There are actually three singularities out there. There is the initial singularity, which is what I was looking at when I was describing the experiment. 
There's the final singularity, which is predicted by quantum mechanics and the second law of thermodynamics. And there is a third singularity out there, which you can't see except through the multiverse. Um, and it connects the two. So there's really only one singularity, which is uh, appears in different in different natural topologies as three. Now, the singularity is something outside of space and time. Um, literally speaking, it is supernatural. That's what supernatural being means outside of nature. Nature is space and time. So if it's something outside of space and time, it is by definition supernatural. Now it's interesting that physics and mathematics is sufficiently powerful today to deduce the existence of something that is outside of itself, um, a singularity. Now, if you want to Google how this is possible, look up Google Cauchy sequences or projective geometry. I'm not going to go any more detail, but if you look at the initial singularity, as you go back into time, remember how physics works. We have initial data and then the equations tell us what the future will be. So what we're told in physics, we push the initial uh, data back as far as we can. We can't push it past the initial singularity. So the initial singularity is responsible for everything that occurs in the universe and it controls everything that occurs in the universe. Now, we could say therefore that the singularity created the entire universe. That's the term used by cosmologists to describe the evolution out of the singularity. So what we've got in the singularity is a supernatural being that created the entire universe out of nothing. You see Teilhard coming into this. In physics of mortality, I was concerned, however, not with the initial singularity, but with the final singularity, the omega point singularity. Now you can also regard determinism as working, not only as we like to think from past to future, but one of the aspects of unitarity is it says, asserts, that you can think of causality as working in the reverse order from ultimate future back to the present. So we have to do certain things today. It is determined that we have to do certain things today in order that the universe will evolve into the omega point. So you can also think of the universe being determined by the final singularity. So the omega point to singularity, in other words, determines everything. This, I think, brings the connection between myself and Teilhard, I think, into full focus. That um, you can, and he was a, uh, a, a Catholic priest, he was also, he was a theologian. He wanted to get God into this. Certainly, God is there in the equations. What can I say? I'm sorry? I couldn't hear. No, it was background noise. I didn't say anything. Okay, well, any case, anything else? Anyone, anyone else want to want me to ask a question? Other questions for Frank? So my last question is, when can we expect your next book? <laughs> I was waiting until the, um, the, the, the final book will be on uh, the, uh, the initial singularity. A judo, uh, it's title, I've already picked the title, a, a, How the Universe Began, a Judeo-Christian Cosmology. And uh, I've more or less written it, so I've got the outline, but I was waiting until the uh, experiment, experimental data that I described here today is released so that um, you can see that it's, what I'm saying is actually true. <clears throat> well, you know, and, uh, it'll be a few years the weather will have to clear unless we can, some by some miracle, get some money to move the observatory. Well, and uh, counting to date, uh, you say that you, uh, if you want to move uh, the equipment, you need something like a quarter of a million dollars, quarter million dollars. which is uh, very much within reach of, uh, you know, this uh, crowdfunding thing, a Kickstarter, this kind of stuff. Have you thought of doing something like that? Send me an email and I'll send them a message. And, I, and beg for money. I'm willing to beg. 
uh, I will write to you about uh, setting up a Kickstarter uh, donation contributed uh, funding campaign. And I think, oh, you, know, you if, mean uh, something like, uh, yeah, these online raising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These I'm kind of things, you know, if, uh, if, if I can uh, get enough, uh, the message out for a quarter of a million dollars. But hey, why not try, right? Oh, well, there have been uh, crowdfunding campaigns that have raised much more money than that. Oh, I know. No. But the crucial thing is uh, getting the message out. Um, getting the message out. You help out. a little, thank you. But... Um, we certainly do. I mean, as a member of the public, if I had the opportunity to contribute to an epoch-making scientific discovery like this, I would be very much uh, happy to donate a couple of hundred bucks and I hope at least well, uh, uh, if I get another thousand people then we yeah, got it yeah, right? yeah at least so with a uh, a thousand a couple thousand supporters you would have the money you need okay but anyway let's uh, well, thank you for the discuss this I'll try, and I'll try that. do we have uh, more questions or comments for Frank It doesn't seem the case. Uh, but we, Ricardo. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening to me. Yes. yes. Uh, Rica uh, Ricardo, mm -hmm. is your microphone working again? I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's yes, working. we can. Yes, we can. So you know, perhaps you can give uh, your answer to Martin's question, which is what do we have to do in order to implement uh, Frank uh, White's? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, like, I actually like one point Dwight made, he said that probably it would be much better if Americans and Russians did things together instead of competing. But this comes to the point that the, the, the notion of no spheres, as it was developed by Tiago de Chardin, that was my presentation, it doesn't, it doesn't con um, deal much with conflict. He is always uh, assuming that there is no conflict or that this is irrelevant. Even the Second World War for him was kind of not so important. It wouldn't stop, you know, the, the most. So what, what we should do actually, I know it's very banal, but it, it should be like cooperating more and uh, com competing less. But of course, I know it's a bit utopian, especially in this moment. So that's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say uh, competition is good sometimes yeah, because when we compete, then everybody moves on, like China is moving, uh, Russia is moving, but sometimes it can also like, uh, we, well, cooperation should be also there. Yeah? It's not just competition. By the way, I, if I can say something, I really appreciated the fact that uh, Frank Tipler mentioned Lucio Russo and his The Forgotten Revolution, because as an historian of ideas, I read that book a few times. And so that's another thing, you know, it's another example related to this, that sometimes knowledge, knowledge can go lost. In that case, it went lost because the library of Alexandria was burned. And of course, we don't know if this was accidental or of course there are the Romans, the Christian, the Arabs are pointing the finger to each other. Maybe it was just accidental, but we lost like half a million books or 700,000 books. So yes, if we, we can progress, if we cooperate, we can progress also if we keep in mind that we shouldn't forget what was done before. That's why I think also history, history of ideas is important uh, and making more copies, of course, of our research. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know if, you, if this is like related to the point. Yeah, it is uh, very much uh, related to the point. Well, I do happen to disagree myself in some sense, because I kind of feel is uh, not something that I can demonstrate elegantly, but is a gut feeling that what we do need today is uh, competition. And uh, I was reading about this thing that uh, NASA directs or uh, Bill Nelson said to a German magazine about uh, Chinese wanting to occupy the South Pole of the moon where the resources are and forbidding access to everyone. Uh, well, you know, I am for cooperation. 
am most certainly not for extreme competition, but I believe uh, the West, our uh, Western uh, culture could uh, really use uh, some competition right now to kind of uh, recover uh, a spirit that in some sense uh, is being lost. But you know, this will, uh, this would really detour too much from uh, the uh, beautiful things that we have been discussing today. And since we are exactly on time, but I see that Ricardo wants to say something. No, I just wanted to add something that maybe we start with competition, but as I see it, it will come natural in the future to move to cooperation. But think about it. Imagine that the Russians and the Chinese and the Americans, uh, together with Europeans, build three main uh, three bases on the moon. Yes, three lunar bases. People that will be there, even if our own countries will keep competing as we did historically many times, and they will want to compete, people living there, they will know that if something goes wrong in one of these bays, they can be helped only by the other ones that are there in a fast way. So they will not, in my opinion, be very like conflicting over there. They will try to keep good relationship, even if here on earth, Countries keep competing, as we can see, the war in Ukraine and whatever. On the moon, the situation will change because humans being there on the moon, we understand that they need to cooperate to help each other. It's enough, I don't know, that the electric system doesn't work in a base. The only thing they can do is moving on, it, on another one. So they have to go to a good relationship. That's why I'm a bit optimistic that we may start with competition, but we will move to cooperation when we are out there. Well, let's uh, be optimist and hope that uh, that is what will happen indeed. Now, uh, I wish to welcome the very last uh, participant who has uh, just joined this meeting. Hello, David. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, we are, uh, we are about uh, to close. Uh, however, everything will be online on uh, YouTube in a couple of days, and uh, you will be able to watch all the talks. I also want to thank uh, all the speakers and all participants in the very interesting uh, discussions. And uh, let's uh, call it a day. I do look forward to seeing all you guys at uh, the IC that Rick has shared the file. I'll take a look later. I do look forward to seeing uh, you guys at the next uh, TerraSEM Colloquium, which will take place on December 14, which will be the 50th anniversary of the last uh, time human beings have been walking on the moon. And uh, let's hope we won't have to do an event for the 60th anniversary. I hope the 60th anniversary will never take place. Having said that, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. I'm taking off. <laughs>